Luca De Gennaro. With, uh, so this is a joint work with Luca De Gennaro, um, my uh, former PhD student, and uh, Stephen Vanderfeld. And I'll be talking about optimal multivariate financial decision making. So to present my quote, uh, Stephen is uh, someone I've uh, been uh, working for. OK, I cannot change slides. Yes, OK, I found a way, sorry. So Stephen has been, uh, you, you can see the second slide? Yes. Uh, yes, we see. Yes. OK, OK, perfect. Uh, so Stephen has been uh, has been working uh, with me for many years, in fact, and we've been traveling together. We've been doing a lot of research while traveling, and so I thought the best way to represent him is in a boat somewhere in uh, near Greek islands. This is uh, where is uh, feeling the best, I think. <laughs> um, and my uh, my second slide is my second quarter is Lucas De Gennaro is my former PhD student who recently moved as a postdoc in uh, China. And this was also a big challenge this year. He graduated in uh, November and, uh, and then tried to go to China this year. This is uh, probably even harder to get than getting a PhD. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, about uh, optimal financial decision making. And I will be reviewing a little bit what happens more traditionally in a univariate case, because there's a lot of things on it. And in particular, I will insist a lot on the role of cost efficiency, why cost efficiency is actually important uh, when you want to make a decision that is related to finance. And then the goal of my talk is to show how to move in multivariate dimension and why is it difficult? And once we understand how to move in multivariate discussion uh, the dimension, I will actually explain and give uh, one application of, uh, of, of our findings, which is uh, an application related to systemic risk. One, the, the second part is, uh, is more, will be actually related to the third application, which is how to, um, the third part actually, yeah. I, I changed slightly the, the order and I didn't update completely the outline, but um, my last application will be related to how to make a multivariate decision and the challenge of choosing a multivariate utility. So this is uh, something that's really not clear in the literature. Lots of people take criteria without really justifying it, just taking it from another paper and without really understanding what are the consequences of choosing this criteria. So I will discuss a little bit what is important, what do we want when we choose a multivariate criteria to optimize, and what is the risk? And the risk in general is to get a criteria that whatever you do, the optimum is always to be all going in the same direction. So being co-monotonic or being all perfectly correlated, which means that if one of us lose money, we will all lose money and at the, at the same time. And of course, in the context of systemic risk, this is uh, a problem. So this is something I will uh, discuss and review uh, later. My, my work builds on several parts, optimal portfolio selection, and I haven't put any references here. I should have put uh, at least the univariate case, the, the work of, uh, of Merton in particular. We work on uh, cost efficiency was really introduced uh, by Divig in 1988 and not so much uh, discussed in the literature. We've uh, reviewed it and uh, extended it a bit in 2014 and not so many people work on it. Um, there's a few papers also on um, quantile formulation of optimal portfolio selection. So the papers of Juni uh, Zhu, uh, of Shui uh, Donghe, um, um, who are that these, these papers are also related to cost efficiency. Sometimes they don't talk about really cost efficiency as a, they don't use this terminology, but this is linked to quantile formulation of uh, optimal portfolio selection. It's linked to multivariate preferences because I will discuss what is good and bad on uh, multivariate decision-making. And uh, this um, literature is more in economics and uh, is, often done without the presence of a finance market. So here, one of the 
novelty and one of the difference compared to all this literature on multivariate preferences is really that I have a financial market, whereas all these papers don't have a financial market. And this complicates a bit the things. There are a few papers that do multivariate utility maximization, but they don't connect to cost efficiency. And I will explain how they connect actually. And uh, one of the most uh, recent one is the one of Campy and Owen. I'll discuss why actually our work goes beyond expected utility. So I haven't put uh, much references here because I don't have really good examples that have a financial market and optimize a uh, multivariate utility, a multivariate non-expected utility setting. And uh, more recently, we have found a few papers who start to look at optimal collective decisions or cooperative decisions. Um, that are more uh, published in the finance field and use the expected utility setting. And again, a multivariate utility setting that is very specific. Finally, we will review also um, with one of the examples of uh, Doldi and Fritelli, because my, my application will be related to systemic risk. And so I'll use some of the um, uh, elements that are in the papers of Doldi and Fritelli. But uh, this literature is far from being exhaustive. These are just the, the main references on which uh, we built. So let me like, start to talk really about cost efficiency, what uh, Dick Vick has actually introduced uh, in 1988, so a long time ago, and was to me underused in the literature in finance, in, uh, in mathematical finance. So cost efficiency, the setting I'm going to use is um, I use a complete market, I have a portfolio, and I have an initial cost budget. So this is really the method setting. I have an initial cost. I have to invest at a um, maturity big T. And <clears throat> actually, I don't care what happens between today and big T. Because I stay in a complete market, I'm just going to optimize over the final wealth. And any final wealth can then be attained using a strategy because of completeness of the market. And so what does it mean I am cost efficient? I have a cost efficient portfolio. It means that if uh, I look at the distribution of this portfolio, I cannot achieve the same portfolio, the same distribution at a cheaper cost. So imagine you invest in a hedge fund. So this is also something that has been done in the more finance literature to test the efficiency of hedge funds. They look at hedge funds returns they look at the distribution of them and they say, okay, how much should I invest at the beginning to get these returns? And they look at what is the cheapest cost I should get to get the same distribution of returns. And if the cheapest cost coincide with the investment that you put in the hedge fund, well done, this is a cost efficient hedge fund. If not, that means that you can find another strategy in the market that is cheaper, strictly cheaper, and can actually uh, give you the same distribution. This has nothing to do with uh, arbitrage because you, you should think of it as two payoffs can have the same distribution with having, without having the same cost. So this is one of the, um, the key elements you need to have in mind is that the distribution is not the same as the payoff. It's only like a feature and there are many payoffs that have the same distribution. And what we're looking at is really the cheapest one, the cheapest strategies, cheapest portfolio, cheapest payoff. I use payoff strategy or portfolio um, for denoting the same thing, which is what you receive at capital T. They can have the same distribution and can have different costs. So simple example would be a digital option. Imagine that you receive one when the stock price goes up and the probability in the real world that it goes up uh, is uh, one half. Then I can have another derivative where you receive one when the stock price goes down. And the probability that you receive one when it goes down is also one half. So these two payoffs are Bernoulli distribution and they don't have the same cost because one will give you one euro, for instance, um, in the up states and one will give you one euro in the down states. It turns out that in the market, receiving one euro when the market crash is more expensive than receiving one euro when the market is up. And so if you're just interested in the cost and in the distribution, so you want a Bernoulli distribution and you want it the cheapest one, 
then you'd better off to receive one when the market goes up, in fact. And so this notion of cost efficiency at the beginning looks a little bit strange, but it's actually related to the expected utility setting. So one advantage of uh, this problem is that it's super simple to solve. And uh, this is to me the, um, the big advantage compared to the expected utility setting where um, or the non-expected utility setting is like each time we choose a different person, you need to have a different method to solve the problem. Here, I have only like all come back to a cost efficiency problem. Um, I see my internet, yeah. Um, so explicit representation of cost efficient payoff. Um, I'll, so this is the solution of the cost efficiency problem. I have a, a problem where it's minimizing the cost for a given distribution. And if I assume the pricing kernel, so psi t is going to be the pricing kernel, it's going to be my change of measure. You can think of it as uh, minimizing the cost for so the budget. This is something I didn't really insist on, but um, the, in this setting, my initial cost, my, my budget is given as the expectation of psi t x t. This is the same. So this expectation is taken under the physical probability measure. So psi t is the pricing kernel or the radon nicodym derivative. And this is the same as the pricing under the risk neutral uh, measure of the discounted payoff, where you take xt and you discount it. And so if I look at the, um, at the, the problem to minimize this cost, given that I have a fixed distribution, if I assume that the pricing kernel is continuously distributed, then the solution is unique. It's actually easy to prove because I have the distribution. If I have the distribution, then if we pay off the, with this distribution, we'll always write as F minus one, which is the quantile of a uniform. So the only thing that I'm not sure is which uniform I need to pick. And the one that will minimize the cost is the one that will minimize the covariance between psi t and xt. The reason is that psi t is the pricing kernel. I know its mean, its variance. xt, I know this distribution, so I know its mean and its variance. So minimizing the cost is the same as minimizing the correlation between psi t and xt. If you want to minimize the correlation between two variables, then you should construct them in such a way that when one goes up, the other one goes down. And this is what we do here. We have f minus one of one minus f psi of psi t. So this is the CDF, it's increasing. f minus one is a quantile, it's increasing. And so this full function is a decreasing function of psi t. It's a decreasing function of psi t. We know that when you apply the CDF of variable, you get a uniform. So this is f psi of psi t is a uniform. One minus u is a uniform. So this is the right distribution. And it's the one, the only one, that is decreasing in psi t. And the, Therefore, it's actually the cheapest one. It's unique, almost surely. And so this problem is actually trivial to solve because in a complete market, you know that this payoff is achieve, like is attainable. In an incomplete market, the problem is that this sometimes this payoff is actually not uh, attainable. So why I feel, and I think that this uh, cost efficiency uh, element is uh, crucial when you want to optimize your portfolio, is because there is a very strong link between cost efficiency and optimal portfolio. And I have a proof of it, and the proof is very simple. If you understand the proof in a one-dimensional case, you will understand why, how we, we generalize to multivariate uh, case, and also why it's, it's still the same, the, this result also holds in a multi-dimensional case. So you, you take an investor with a budget X0, and you assume that you're maximizing the expected utility for some utility increasing. So here we are univariate case. My claim is that the optimal portfolio must be cost efficient. If it must be cost efficient, it means that when you solve the maximum expected utility setting, it must be of this form. There is no other choice. Your optimum must be written this way. And so 
This is why there is a connection between quantile formulation of optimal post solution is that this F minus one of a uniform, the only unknown here is F minus one, is the quantile. And we are looking for an expected utility maximizer. So we are looking for this quantile. So if this result is true, then we only look for a quantile when you want to optimize an expected utility. Now, why this, is, this must be true, this is actually very simple to prove. You just do it by contradiction. And you say, okay, XT star is not cost efficient. What does it mean? It means that I can find another portfolio that has the same distribution. If it has the same distribution, it's actually equal in expected utility. But it's strictly cheaper. If it's strictly cheaper, I have some extra cash that I could save if I invest in Y instead of investing in XT star, my optimal cost efficient strategy. And so what do I do with this extra cash? I put it in a bank account, very simple. And because my utility is strictly increasing, what we have is that the expected utility of YT plus this extra cash, like with some interest rate, will actually be strictly higher than the expected utility of Y, which is equal to my optimal expected utility. And here you see that we have violated the optimality of XT star because this new payoff, YT plus B is actually higher in expected utility strictly than our optimum. So this is not possible, even that it has the same budget, but it violates the optimality of XT star. So what do we have assumed? We have assumed it's not cost efficient. So the conclusion is that it is cost efficient. And this is really the same reasoning that works in, a, in higher dimension and in a, a more general multivariate utility setting. So um, what do we have? In fact, I approved the unexpected utility the, uh, composition, but this is just as an illustration because what I use in the proof is one is I use the low invariant of expected utility to say that they have the same objective function and I use the increasingness. But actually the fact that it's expected utility, we don't care. And this is why the result that I just gave is true if you have much more general preferences. So imagine that you maximize something or you minimize a low invariant um, increasing uh, risk measure, then what you have is that this optimum must be cost efficient and so must be of this, this form, xt star being f minus one of one minus f psi of psi t. In particular, if you're non-decreasing and low invariant, these are not strong uh, assumptions. So I, I remember the first time, so a few years ago when we were working on it, uh, one of the first rejection we got was that um, by an economist who just said, low invariance is bad. You should use first order stochastic dominance. Um, you should yeah, relate it to stochastic dominance because stochastic dominance is actually uh, well accepted, but low invariance is a too strong concept because people don't have low invariant preferences. And uh, what we found is, and it's very easy to prove, that non-decreasing and low invariance is actually equivalent to first order stochastic dominance. So if you're convinced that first order stochastic dominance is good, then you're convinced that being increasing more, you prefer more to less. So this is very logic. So this one is uh, usually accepted. But being also low invariant means that you don't care about the states in which you receive the cash flow is also accepted. Otherwise, you need to accept to violate first order stochastic dominance. And there are like many um, objective functions that satisfy first order stochastic dominance. They are well accepted in a non-expected utility setting also, like a cumulative prospect theory, or if you take the quantile. And uh, for all of them, you can optimize the portfolio. And at the end, the optimum will always be of this form. And so that doesn't depend on the shape of the, um, of the preferences or the choice of the preferences. It's only the, the type of quantile that will depend on the type of uh, preferences that you pick. And so why, why it actually generalizes to a multivariate case? So I'm going to give you just a, a general statement. 
is that if you have low invariant preferences, and now this is a multivariate preferences, so it means that your function V of x1, x2, xd, so you have a d-dimensional vector on which you optimize. So you can think of it as d different investments. You have a total budget. So the budget of the sum is actually W0. This is your total budget to invest in this um, d-dimensional. And it's low invariant means that if you have a joint distribution for x1, xd, then the value of it is the same if you change the payoff, but you keep the same distribution. I also assume, and this is a very weak assumption, I only need increasingness in one of the D dimensions. If, if I have increasingness in one of the D dimensions, I must be multivariate cost efficient. And what do we call multivariate cost efficient? It's almost like cost efficiency. You see, when D is equal to one, it's actually cost efficiency because you, have, you fix the distribution of X and you will have the budget of X. Here, I have a D-dimensional object, D-dimensional joint distribution, and this is my budget for investing in the D-dimensions. And so why this is correct, this is exactly the same reasoning. You would do it by contradiction and say, if it's not cost efficient, I can find a cheaper Y1, Y2, Y2, D. And if it's strictly cheaper, then you save some budget, and because you're increasing in at least one of the D components, what you do, you invest this budget in this component in which it is increasing. And because it's increasing in this, uh, in this component, then you will actually beat your optimum and this will lead to a contradiction. So you must be multivariate cost efficient. So questions for everyone, is that good to be cost efficient? Because um, if, if you, like expected utility, you would say, yeah, usually I maximize my expected utility. And so if you're telling me maximum expected utility leads to cost efficiency, then it's good to be cost efficient. If, if you like to minimize the uh, uh, low invariant risk measures, then it's the same. You would say, yes, it's good to be cost efficient. And that's true. If you only care about the distribution, so you are actually low invariant. And also if um, you, have, you prefer more to less. So if you think of an online workshop, it's actually cost efficient. And if you just care about receiving the content of the talk and maybe learning about the talk, this is enough. But if you care about the states in which uh, you would receive this uh, knowledge, then it's different. And so we uh, often organize uh, workshops in, in nice places with Stephen uh, in, uh, in Greece. And and so if you care about the states in which cash flows happen, then actually it's not good to be cost efficient. And so we have two pictures from uh, the place where we did the workshop the last time and we hope to do the next time in 2022 now because uh, we canceled the one in 2021. And uh, this is indeed not cost efficient maybe, but, uh, but at least uh, good for people who like about states where things happen. Okay, now I said, okay, univariate cost efficiency is super easy to solve and we have an explicit solution. Now, is it hard to be cost efficient in a multivariate setting? And uh, as soon as you go multivariate, uh, there are like many issues and it's not necessarily an uh, easy problem. But it turns out that to solve the multivariate cost efficient payoff, numerically, it's always possible. And it's I mean, it's instantaneous. Like it's not like an algorithm that does not converge or takes a lot of time. It's instantaneous. It's just in one step, you get uh, numerically an approximation of the optimum as close as you want to the problem for any possible joint distribution. So if I look at the, the, this uh, multivariate cost efficient problem, here, I can put any joint distribution. I can put something discrete. I can put continuous, mixed. It doesn't matter. If you think of solving a multivariate uh, expected utility problem, if you manage to solve it, it will probably be with a very specific utility with very specific um, situation. Or if you do a non-expected utility setting, for now, we don't, we don't even have found uh, examples for that that are not uh, trivial and lead to commonotonicity. So, there are like really uh, a need for 
for solving uh, this kind of thing. And here, what we say is like, if you take multivariate cost efficiency as a good criteria, means that you believe, for instance, for multivariate expected utility, then numerically you can always solve your problem. If you like theory, then this is a real challenge. So in, in theory, we don't know how to solve this problem. And we are only able to solve it in the multivariate Gaussian case, which means I assume that the target distribution I want is a multivariate Gaussian. I want to find it as a minimum cost, then I can solve it explicitly. But if it's not the multivariate Gaussian, for now, I don't know how to solve it. So let me show how, how to solve it. So multivariate cost efficiency, I'm recalling the, the definition, it's a problem in D dimension in which you fix the joint distribution that you want and you minimize the budget that you need to achieve this joint distribution. I don't, yeah, I don't put the maturity anywhere, but you should really find, think of it as a one-step problem where you have the maturity that is fixed and you just optimize at maturity the problem. Um, Maximi so minimizing this thing is minimizing the product between psi t and this sum. And it turns out that minimizing the product, I talked, I explained this a little bit with the univariate case, but the multivariate case is the same here, is the same as minimizing the correlation between the sum and psi t. And so what we're going to do is, at least numerically, is to construct a dependence between x1, x2, xd, and psi such that when you sum them, the, the behavior of it is neg as negative as possible with respect to psi t, so as negatively correlated as possible, so anti-monotonic with psi t. And so once you understand this, the algorithm is almost trivial. So we fix the joint distribution. So we'll look at this, uh, this matrix. So for now, you forget about the first column where you see the psi t, and just look at the square matrix, not square. <coughs> so it's a matrix in which I put n samples of the joint distribution between x1, x2, and xd. And to get these n samples, you can use uh, simulations, or if you have a way to, to do a, a grid, you can also put a grid. In a one-dimensional case, usually you do f minus one, one over n, and this gives you a, a grid of equiprobable realization of the distribution. Here, um, if you have uh, a grid of a n-dimensional space, you could, um, you could use it, or you can just simulate. If you simulate n realization of this joint distribution, you put them in a matrix. So each row of this matrix gives me one realization of this d-dimensional vector. If I want more accuracy, I just add more simulation, more realization of this distribution, because the more realization I have, the smoother is the, the representation of the distribution. And so ideally, I have an infinite one, and this gives me a density of x1, x2, x3. And now once I have these d columns, I calculate the sum of x1 to xd, so the black values in the matrix. And I order, so this is my si, and what I do then is I order, I change the block rows, each block rows, so that if these ones, psi t1, psi t2, psi tn are simulated values of psi t, or a discretized version of uh, the distribution of psi t, so psi t has a continued distribution, but you can always discretize it as much as you want, in fact, as many as you want, and you put them in, in uh, increasing order, so I just make them in increasing order there. And so then in this uh, matrix, I make sure that this sum is actually the biggest because psi t1 is the smallest. And so I just reorganize the, the, the samples, my n samples, I reorganize them to order in terms of value of the sum. And then if I look at the joint distribution of psi t x1, x2, xd, so now I include the first column, this gives me, gives me a copula, in fact, a discrete copula uh, that approximates 
a distribution of the optimal solution. Because now it actually characterized to the, the cost efficiency um, for, for cost, to get cost efficient, I, I actually need this anti-monotonicity anti between X1, XD, the sum and anxiety. And I do have this common anti-monotonicity by uh, using this construction. And so numerically, it's almost trivial because it's a one step is just rearranging a matrix and then you have the solution. You just need to read the matrix and to interpret this as a joint distribution between psi t, x1, x2, xt. And to prove or to verify actually that our algorithm was correct, we, were, uh, we looked for an example in which we were able to solve explicitly this um, multivariate cost efficiency problem. And we did find one, which is uh, in the case of multivariate normal distribution. So if you take a Black-Scholes model, in the Black-Scholes model, the, the Radon-Nicodym derivative, um, or the ratio of the densities between the Aristotle world and the real world will lead to this value. And uh, Psi-T in particular is log-normal. And so if you take the log of psi t in, uh, in the Black-Scholes market, it's a normal distribution. And so what we find is that a multivariate cost efficient payoff to minimize the cost of achieving x1, x2, xd that is distributed as a multivariate Gaussian with a given vector of mu, with a given vector uh, matrix of sigmas, given correlation, then it's actually obtained in a um, uh, in a payoff x1 star, xt star, log psi t, because now it depends on log psi t, such that the correlation between um, log psi t and x i star are ai, and ai is an explicit uh, expression. I didn't put it on the slide, but this is explicit. And in particular, if you construct this, um, this joint distribution this way, with this uh, correlation matrix, what you find is that the sum of xi star is indeed negatively correlated with the log of psi t. So here it's just a normal, log of psi t is normal, and we find that they are just, when you sum them, they are like aligned, and then they get um, exactly uh, negatively correlated with the log of psi t. Numerically, how, so it's, Instantaneous procedure, we do it with uh, an example, this completely uh, arbitrary example. And so, just to illustrate, what do we have? This is our initial joint distribution x1, x2, x1, x3, x2, x3. a1, a2, and a3 are actually the theoretical values because we can solve the multivariate normal uh, solution in theory for multivariate cost efficiency, but are also the correlation that we find numerically by applying our procedure. So you start by a three-dimensional sample, x1, x2, x3. You reorganize your matrix, and then you plot once you, so if I go to this matrix, here I have x1, x2, x3, which is a multivariate normal three dimension. I reorganize it, anti-monotonic with psi t. And when I do that, what I get is x1 and log psi t are not perfectly correlated. x2 with log psi t is not perfectly correlated. x3 with log psi t is not perfectly correlated. They're all kind of negatively correlated. And where the magic happens, and this is because of multivariate cost efficiency, is that for each realization, if you pick x1 plus x2 plus x3, and you plot it with respect to log psi t, so this is the panel D, x1 plus x2 plus x3 plotted against log psi t, you find that it's exactly a negative uh, correlation, a correlation minus one, in fact. Uh, we did the procedure with 10,000, but that doesn't really matter. You could do 100,000, 1 million, it still works, and it's super accurate. The first two digits of the correlation are already correct, and you need more discretization if you want more precision for this A1, A2, and A3 but they match with the, the exact uh, theoretical ones. And okay, so now we know how to compute the multivariate cost efficient strategy. When, when we have a given distribution, we know how to do it numerically. If it's a multivariate Gaussian, we know how to do it in theory. 
and the match, fortunately. So we, we kind of uh, convinced that this is uh, correct, everything works. And we worked on several applications. The first application is really, uh, I would say, direct, it's just improving a multivariate optimal allocation. When, uh, when you have your, your portfolio, if it's not cost efficient, you can just improve it. Second application where we feel that this is the strongest application is uh, how to reduce systemic risk. And the third is how to, I, I'll try to convince you in fact that this is a new multivariate objective because I'm, when I'm looking at a cost efficient strategy, my input is a distribution and I minimize the cost. What you use when you have a multivariate portfolio to find, your input is a multivariate utility and you solve your optimal portfolio. But the input is either a utility or a joint distribution. And to me, it's more intuitive to have the joint distribution because then you, you know what you're getting at the end. You're getting this joint distribution. Whereas if you optimize the utility, you have no idea why this utility is good to optimize. It's already hard in one dimension to understand what is the effect of optimizing one utility rather than another one. In n dimension, I would think for now I have absolutely no intuition of what should be the optimum when you optimize uh, multivariate utility. So this is a better objective. So let's go to the first point, which is improving a multivariate allocation. Imagine that you have chosen your portfolio, you have low invariant preferences, you're maximizing an objective function, and we know that. If this is low invariant, if you're increasing in at least one of the decomponents, then you must be multivariate cost efficient. And so if I apply this proposition, so I'm just recalling it here because I already discussed it, I just apply this distribution, what does it mean? It means that if I take my d-dimensional portfolio, I sum it, I look at the sum of xi, mm -hmm. and I observe that it's not decreasing in the market, in the inside, in the pricing kernel. If it's not decreasing in the pricing kernel, or if it's not increasing in the market portfolio, because the pricing kernel can be seen as one over the market portfolio. So if my sum is not like increasing trend, then what happens is that you can find a new strategy that is strictly cheaper and that is better. Better in the sense that your objective function will be uh, higher if you invest this extra money that you can save on your budget in the dimension in which your objective function is increasing. Uh, so you can construct the multivariate cost efficient portfolio that has the same distribution, and this will be actually the, um, the way to improve the strategy, unless, of course, you already follow a cost efficient strategy, then you cannot use cost efficiency to improve your strategy. If it's optimal, then, then there is nothing to improve. Second application, I want to, to discuss why cost efficiency actually is maybe not so good criteria, but a lot of banks use it for optimizing. One of the reasons is that the constraint that they have is um, often based on their own risk. They have uh, 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 risk allocation constraints, they have um, capital constraints, and all of that are linked to evaluate risk, expected shortfall, or whatever. They are distri distributional constraints. If you know the distribution, you know these constraints. And also, they have uh, for many years maximized expected utility or used the mean variance portfolio. They used low invariant preferences. And so, if you don't constrain a bank or don't constrain the portfolio manager and you just tell him, okay, optimize your portfolio with a few constraints that only consist of him, then it is not state dependent and actually is going to behave like somebody with increasing low environment preferences and will construct a portfolio of this form, F minus one, one minus F side of state. And therefore, if everybody does this, everybody, as a different F, because this is the distribution of your portfolio, so there can be different distribution depending on your risk aversion, depending on what you do with your money. But one common feature is that all these portfolios are co-monotonic. They will all be decreasing in size, and they will all be long in the market. 
And if this is the case, <coughs> because Psi T, you can interpret it. It's the pricing kernel. It's actually the price today of receiving one in the future in this particular state omega. And because our optimal strategies are all decreasing in Psi, it means that everyone in the market receives less in the most expensive states of the market. Most expensive states are the places during a crisis. When the market crash, this is the place that are most expensive to insure, and everybody who optimize has actually received the least amount of money. And so this is, as a regulator's perspective, the worst that can happen. Everybody long in the market and no protection or the lowest protection for every uh, possible the worst states in the market. And so all agents have a common allocation. You obtain highest correlation also between the players of the market and so higher systemic risk. One of the comments that was already uh, expressed in 2009 is that if you want to deal with uh, systemic risk, you should not regulate systemic risk as a one-dimensional problem. You should look at joint distribution. You should look at not one bank in isolation. So it's not enough to just say to this bank, you should keep your VAR less than whatever, two million. It, what is important is, is to look at the bank and say you should connect to the others and not be too much correlated. Of course, this is not this is easy to say, it's hard to, to, to implement. And uh, here we propose actually a way to, to implement it. And what do we propose? We propose to add an, an extra constraint. You say, a regulator, say, okay, I observe all my banks optimizing. I know their portfolios. I know they are fully co-monotonic and I want to charge them for being co-monotonic. So I'm going to collect money from them. And with this money, I will invest in a fund and I will invest in such a way that I will change the dependence between them. And so this is what we managed to do with multivariate cost efficiency is to add a constraint to say, I don't want, if everybody, a very simple case, and this is the, the example I will take, everybody has an exponential utility. When you maximize your exponential utility, you get a normal distribution. They are all co-monotonic, so correlation is one for everyone. Now, if you have a regulator say, no, 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 that is bad, I want correlation to be zero between everyone, which is the extreme case, it means like all your banks are independent. How much would it cost to actually make sure that the returns of the banks are fully independent? So you need to, to adopt a strategy to this to, to, mod to modify the global outcome of your uh, D-banks. And uh, this is what cost efficiency or multivariate cost efficiency allows you to, to do. So let me go in the setting. We take a log normal market, that's the simplest market, an investment horizon of T. We have exponential utility. If you maximize exponential utility in a marathon setting, you will see that your optimal portfolio is a function of log psi T. So it turns out that it's normally distributed. And this normal is linked to two parameters that I call mu i and sigma i, and the budget is related to these parameters in this way. So the budget is directly linked to how much uh, expectation you want, how much sigma you want, and it's actually linked to your alpha i. So your mean is linked to alpha i, and there is a formula that, uh, that joins the two, but it's easier for me in my setting because I, I look at the distribution of my optimum to then say my optimum is of this form, with a mean mu i t and the standard deviation of sigma i square root of t. And now I want to enforce global diversification and I want to say, I don't want them, I want them to have the same uh, distribution. So x i has the same normal distribution, but I want them to be not perfectly correlated. And so I want to have x1, x d, sorry, so this must be a d a d-dimensional optimum that follows a multivariate normal distribution with uh, parameters sigma and mu. And at the cheapest cost, which is expectation of this, this is my, the price of my portfolio, minus 
So this is the, the, the portfolio in which I have this extra constraint, which is that the correlation is not perfect. This is the multivariate cost efficient portfolio. And then we move the cheapest, the cheapest point, which is when you don't have a constraint, then people will just align all of them to be cost efficient in a univariate setting. And they will just have their budget to achieve their normal distribution without constraint. And this extra constraint can be written in terms of the sigmas uh, of the different uh, normal distribution. And what we find is that this extra budget is equal to zero, for instance, in the commonotonic situation in which all rho i is equal to one, which is logic because if you force the distribution, the joint distribution to be commonotonic, then actually this is a redundant uh, constraint because without this extra constraint, people will be commonotonic. So it's only when you deviate from commonotonicity that you add an extra cost. But it turns out that it's extra cost. If you really want to assume like how to, to force them to be independent will be very big. So that's what we numerically find is that you need, for instance, to get, uh, if you had only two banks and you want them to be independent, you will need to add 60% of extra budget to get that, to move from commonotonicity in which you are there. If you want independence, you are there. And it goes very quickly, very high when you add a lot of, uh, a lot of um, agents. So this additional budget uh, goes uh, very quickly, very high. Further application, and uh, I, I will uh, not go, yeah, I will not go too much in details on that, but we want to use multivariate cost efficiency as a new multivariate objective to ensure that optimal post strategies are not commonotonic. And so why this is uh, good, and I believe that a lot of people are not aware of that, is that when you pick your multivariate utility function, very often your optimal allocation is commonotonic. And so this is the case, for instance, in this uh, particular example, where so we have maximum uh, multivariate preferences given budget. And one of the questions we, we ask and we try to answer in the, question, in the, the paper is, what, how do I choose V so that I'm not commonotonic at the end? And so if, if you have a regulator who doesn't want to use multivariate cost efficiency and lead, prefer an objective like more traditionally like, like this one, how should it choose V? And it turns out that if it choose V in a class of super, super modular preferences, for instance, the sum of utilities, sum of individual utilities will be super modular and will lead automatically with uh, everyone being anti-monotonic. So again, we have co-monotonic multivariate allocation. And this is a case that has been uh, seen in many of the papers that do uh, collective investment. They often have this uh, supermodular preferences because this is a case that you can solve explicitly, in fact. Uh, if you go for some modularity, which is actually more intuitive and uh, for instance, Doldi and Fritelli use um, a proposition where you have this first part, which is a sum of individual utilities, but they add what they call a concave aggregator. And that allows to reverse the, um, the derivative and make the utility submodular. Submodular is good for a regulator, but is actually leading to a very difficult problem that we cannot solve. So submodular is a desired property. It's like correlation aversion. So I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with this kind of literature, but this is a literature where um, you say you prefer 50-50 gamble between um, a loss in health and a loss in wealth over 50-50 gamble uh, where you lose uh, both in wealth and in health or not. And so this is like you prefer to diversify the risk to to make sure that both negative things don't happen together. And this is really the regulator. The regulator wants bad things, bankruptcy, not to happen together if he wants to avoid cost efficiency. And in the case of some modular preferences, in fact, I write it here, the form of the optimal solution of maximum expected utility is still unclear. We, we don't know how to solve it, in fact. 
And so we believe that multivariate cost efficiency is a solution to solve it. But uh, apart from that, we don't know how to do it. Um, yeah, in in the paper, and this is at the very end, and uh, and we are not able to completely generalize it. In fact, in a one-dimensional setting, there is a complete bijection between the distribution F, your target distribution that you minimize the cost, and the utility. And so if you really want to maximize expected utility and not use cost efficiency, that's fine because for any cost, any distribution, there is a utility, and for any utility, there is a distribution. So for instance, for the exponential utility, it's the same as minimizing the cost of getting a normal distribution. You will get the same optimum. But this result is not clear how to extend in a higher dimension in the sense that if I give you a joint distribution like this multivariate Gaussian, I'm not sure I have a multivariate uh, utility function that I can optimize. So we haven't found one that is not state dependent. And we have an example in the, in the paper, which is a bit ad hoc because the utility depends on, um, uh, so in this case, we find co-monotonicity because we find um, it's supermodular, but we have one example in which we find a bivariate Gaussian, but you can see that the utility depends on psyche. So it's a stochastic utility. So we don't have a, a good example yet of multivariate preferences that enforce uh, diversification. So let me conclude. We have uh, developed a natural extension of cost efficiency to a multivariate setting. Um, we propose this uh, as a tool to optimize. And we believe that this is a good tool because it's simple to optimize and it allows to not lead to commonotonic allocation, which is something that is very hard to control if you just pick a utility. Because even a submodular utility, it's not clear that when you optimize it, you would actually avoid commonotonic allocation. And so maybe uh, if you have to do algorithmic uh, trading or robo advisor, then maybe it's a good way to uh, program your robo advisor to make sure that he has some diversification between the different players and uh, that they will collectively not lose everything at the same time. So thank you for listening. And if you have any question, feel free to ask them. I have uh, put some references here. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Carol. It's time for questions or comments. So uh, are there any questions? You can do the questions by chat or orally. Are there any questions, oral, for example? I have a naive question. Okay. Lisa? So, thanks a lot for the talk, Carol. It's super interesting to see this uh, joint uh, way to control the risk or to address the risk. One uh, naive question is, these explicit representations you were talking about are really model dependent, are robust or, or super sensible to the underlying model? I have no idea. I think we have, so far we have done no robustness tests towards the, I would expect there is kind of robustness because, because I don't see why it would not be robust, but I haven't done any experiments. So this is indeed uh, something that we should check, like robustness to, to model assumptions. Like you mean, if we deviate a bit from black shows, what would happen? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, this more I research have no idea. To do. That's a good. That's a good point and a good question. Yeah, more research to do. <laughs> more research to do. Yes, there is always more research to do. Mm, indeed. Yeah. Related with this, I have a question and that uh, similar computations, similar analytical computations uh, can be done for different models from Black Scholes or, you know? It, yeah, it, the, what you need is the pricing kernel. So in, if, you, if um, you are in an incomplete market, the problem is that you can still do it. You can find a strategy that is the cheapest, but now the, the challenge is, how can you replicate it? But any, any model where you have XIT and you can do in a stone, there are like formulas for XIT in many, many models because it's just a ratio of, of uh, densities under P and the Q. So if you know your model under P in the real world and under Q in the crystal world, you actually can do that. And 
derive this optimal strategy, but this optimal strategy that we find, we don't prove the attainability. So it's an attainable in incomplete market, of course, but it's not clear that in an incomplete market, you can always attain this strategy. Okay. So it's a little bit like when you do um, yeah, optimization over the final wealth in a univariate expected utility setting, and then you change your psi, and then maybe this U prime minus one lambda xi which you see in many papers on expected utility. When you move to incomplete market, this method fails a bit because you're not sure that you actually reach that, and then you need to do to use stochastic control or other methods. Okay. Other questions or comments, maybe by chat. No. Uh, okay. Another question is: uh, What's the main reference of your talk in this? Uh, maybe in this list. Uh, so, uh, Carol. We built a little bit on on nothing, in fact. Because ah. there is there is nothing done on multivariate cost efficiency, and even this connection, the the fact that the sum must be decreasing in size, is see. not does not appear anywhere in the literature. So, and and what we found is like apart from the work of Campy, Campy and Owen, uh, but in in their setting when they maximize some multivariate utility, they always find that the optimum is co-monotonic. So all their examples, they, they have a multivariate utility, but it turns out like it's like a super modular case where when you optimize, at the end, your sum of individual utility or your product of utility that they use, in all their examples, they end up having a co-monotonic allocation. And they use a completely different method and they don't even note that at the end, the sum is decreasing anxiety. But for them, it's like obvious because each individual asset is decreasing in society. So of course, the sum is decreasing in society. But if the utility were not to be uh, super modular, then possibly the the sum would like the each individual would not be decreasing in society. It's only the sum that would be. And this is something you don't see in the literature. So for now, we are really yeah we're we're struggling to find relevant references. So if, if it makes you think about something, uh, like don't hesitate to email me a, a reference or some directions of uh, people who have worked on, on multivariate decision-making in the presence of a financial market. Because we, we have some people who have uh, worked on uh, multivariate preferences, like um, this paper from 2007, like uh, a good sign for multivariate risk-taking. This is really on how to choose the objective function, but they don't have a financial market. And here we're really looking at financial decision in the presence of a financial market. And so they don't have this criteria that the sum must be decreasing in society because they don't have a budget, they don't have a financial market. They use their objective just to compare two multivariate uh, vector. So that's, uh, that's what they do. Okay, uh, thank you. Other questions? Okay, if uh, not, uh, we make a break of uh, half an hour and you see uh, at 11.30 for the talk of uh, Professor Julia Di Nuno. So uh, we make uh, a break. Okay, see you in half an hour. See you later. Thank you, thank you very much. For the talk. Work uh, double for this, uh, for this uh, workshop. It's uh, so it's a praise to the organizers that never give up. So thank you. <laughs> and uh, so this is joint work with uh, my colleague Fred Espen Bent and uh, with our PhD student uh, Eben uh, Simonsen, who is um, possibly finishing already in the fall. And uh, this, uh, um, yes, so uh, the topic of my work here is uh, really putting together the let's say interests of um, this uh, small group and the orientation is towards uh, uh, 
electricity markets, and there is where the need for infinite dimensional is coming up. So I'm just introducing a little bit the model, model which was already introduced in the literature by Fred and Eben, but this other part is about understanding what is the meaning of some analysis of robustness around this model, where by this term, this time, I mean to look first thing first, a little bit the shaking up of the parameters, so the sensitivity and what is the meaning of these things. So um, let me say a little bit about the specifics of the electricity market that make it a little bit uh, special in the framework of finance, so shall we say. And uh, let's say that in, uh, in electricity, this, uh, this, the basic uh, element of knowledge is actually uh, identified by the forward contracts. So by ST, we have the spot prices, and by F capital is the forward price. So these are the two things we look at, typically. And there is a lot of modeling uh, on the S or on the F, and the F and S are, of course, connected, but uh, there are different approaches. And I'm not really going into that business so much, besides recalling that electricity itself, per se, is a commodity that has the specifics that cannot be held. So you cannot really buy and purchase electricity and, and have holding strategies. So this is affecting some foundations of mathematical finance, if you want, because of course, in the all analysis of arbitrage, for example, the, technic the technique is based on strategies which include the possibility to buy and hold the commodity and then sell it when it's more appropriate. And this is technically not possible with electricity per se. Of course, from a you know, more extended point of view, you can surely think about holding electricity in other formats. So you can have a water reservoir and produce it at need, but that's not the same thing. No, it's water reservoir and not the commodity per se. And nowadays the interest is towards hydrogen and batteries and all these other ways that effectively could change a little bit the market structure within electricity. So now that we said this, this is the first thing to remember. The second is that electricity is not delivered instantaneously. So again, when you discuss strategies, you discuss that you are not giving a cargo of something which is bumped into the harbor, delivered, finished, but it is a process of delivery. So we talk about delivery period, and here it's going to be identified by T1, T2. So effectively, if this is the shape of any forward contract in electricity, it looks like this, where you have a time little t, which is uh, well, your running time, T1 and T2 represent the beginning and the end of the delivery period, and this is uh, uh, the uh, spot price at T, which now have, should have been T1 in here. Uh, so what happens is that in general, you can have a relationship between the delivery over a period and the delivery, let's say, instantaneous. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is now here written in this uh, purple uh, formula with uh, this integral in the continuous time you are integrating, otherwise it would be a summation over in, in between periods. And you see that there is this weight function here, which is in this case connected as an average over the period. Like if you were actually moving to uh, a uniform evaluation over the period. And this factor can be actually, now it's written like this, I'm just taking this one because it's very common, but here you can have a different weighting function. And this is reflecting how the contract is settled. Basically, the point is, since you're delivering over a period, when are you exchanging money? Are you exchanging them at the beginning or you at the end, or maybe uniformly during the 
delivery period as it is represented here, basically. So these are specifications that can change. Mm -hmm. Now, since it's not important for us, we just keep them like this, which is standard and kind of uh, nice. Okay, another thing uh, which is uh, typical in the analysis is that uh, we have talked about a delivery period uh, and uh, but it is borrowed by interest rate theory. It's often nice to talk about time to delivery instead of the two times, basically, just to make a more spatial version of the delivery part. And uh, this is, of course, borrowed, as I said, from uh, interest rate theory. And in that case, you see, instead of having the delivery period T1, T2, then you can represent it as the time where you're standing and the time to delivery. And of course, in this case, D would be the size of the delivery period. But this is just a re-parameterization which of course makes it uh, particularly well, nice in many uh, uh, modeling approaches. So this little g is the same as the big G before, is uh, representing the forward price over the delivery period, reformulated in this Musiela type of notation. So, so far, no big surprises in here. Right. And, um, then what is that we want to do in this particular talk here? So we want to give a representation of the forward price, which is linked to a specific model and uh, which I'm going to tell you about in here. And this model is a model which includes stochastic volatility. And the second thing is to study as I have anticipated this uh, sensitivity. And for doing that, the idea was to borrow from, uh, uh, by now, fairly established literature uh, using also techniques of Malyavan calculus. And um, I will show you what are the goods, the pros, the bad thing, and a lot of limitations about that um, in this talk, but uh, we'll take it uh, in steps. Okay, so. First thing is that um, in, uh, in the, this particular modeling, we are working in a Hilbert space setting. And we take a specific Hilbert space, which is this space here called H with little w, where little w is again as a kind of weight function. And uh, this is in the risk, in the, interest rate uh, domain is called this uh, Filipovich space, at least it's introduced by him in that setting. And it is linked to functions, as you, hear, as you see here, that have this particular norm finite. So you see that there is an evaluation at zero, and then you have uh, this particular kind of norm where this is the weak derivative, and this is a weight which is a priori chosen. And uh, I'll tell you why this space is interesting in a, just one slide to come. But uh, the weight function per se is, of course, part of the modeling choice. And it is a function that has this um, growth that you see here. So uh, the, it is uh, starting from one. OK, this is a normalization feature. But here is the important the important element that you can uh, see. And uh, the basic for choosing this function is how the evaluation functional is treated. So the evaluation functional is uh, here indexed by delta x. I have to say that we have used a, a standard notation both for the evaluation and for the score of the integral, but so I warn you, when you have a little x in here, this is the valuation functional. When you will be told, it will be a score of an integral notation, but it's easy to recognize the difference. And uh, this is the valuation at x. x. And uh, the point is that uh, you take this function and you want to evaluate it in the point x. And in general, this is a functional, but it's nice that it is continuous. 
And this is how this space comes in very handy. So we can say that this evaluation function is a linear continuous operator. And, uh, and in this case, then you can apply the risk Ritz theorem and represent the whole functional in terms of one particular element of the very space HW, of course, in the norm that makes this space Hilbert. So this is the representation of the evaluation functional. Okay, and um, this particular element mm, is not any element. We can actually give a specific formula for it. And this particular element has the, the formula, you see, depends on the W, which is inside the structure of the space. Okay, so this is, I would say, the major motivation for using this particular space here. Right, now let's see a moment about the model that uh, we wanted to discuss. So this model started out as a, a little bit of an exercise for uh, Eben, but then it turned out to be not so bad at all. So the point is that uh, is being in this, uh, uh, so we have this um, forward prices that basically are curves you know, to represent. And in this uh, electricity market, this power market, there are uh, many features that should be captured and uh, it's complicated to capture all of them, but definitely there is intertemporal correlation. That is one feature. And then there is a general non-Gaussianity. Now, non-Gaussianity means of course, a lot of things, including a lot of jumps, which we are not discussing at all here. But this is a way to include a non-Gaussianity in a, in a way that at least in other contexts with the stochastic volatility has been quite successful. So that's the reason to explore this direction. Now, the fact uh, that, yes. Sorry, quick question. In order to understand what you are talking about, what yes. is X, what is Y? Yeah, but I have to tell you. I okay, fine. Say, just mm -hmm. give me a second. Yes, the point, that, that um, is, uh, I wanted just to say before coming to the specifics is uh, that this intertemporal correlation and non-Gaussianity are statistically studied. And I would say by now quite proved, I mean, there is quite a consensus that, uh, but it's not surprising that the world is not only Gaussian. So that is one. Now coming to the question I just got and the specific. So, you see, here we have, in a classical um, volatility model, you have a major equation and, a, the, say, a volatility equation in here. So here is exactly what we have. So x is the major equation and y represents the volatility, which appears, you don't see it, but effect, and it's coming in some other slides, the y appears inside this gamma z. I have to tell you how it appears inside here, right? So we have this kind of Ornstein Ulenbeck infinite dimensional process. This is a linear equation. B is a Brownian motion with covariance QB. W is another independent Brownian motion, Wiener process with QW as covariance, intercorrelations inside is described here. Okay, so the, what we have is you see is this linear structure with additive noise. But in this case, the influence of Y comes inside this gamma Z, okay? So then you also have two operators here, C and A, which are described in here and have a C0 semigroup, and this is the order that C is U and A is S. Okay, uh, let's proceed further so we can reply to all questions about this or some questions about this because uh, we still don't know everything. And so this gamma Z, how is it 
described. So gamma Z is associated to yet another process that is coming in in this way. So first of all, we consider the norm equal to one, just a normalization element. And then we have exactly this operation that is taking place. So uh, in substance, the examples, that the, the Z can be chosen. That is, is an intrinsic part of your freedom of choice in the modeling. But the standard example is to have Z exactly of this type with another Y, in which case you find again the variance process, uh, what you can call variance process in here. Hmm? And in this case, there is also quite a nice decomposition. This is uh, uh, coming in the representation of this uh, uh, variance process in terms of what you may call square root, if you want. And this is exactly the gamma. Mm -hmm. So this is why gamma is appearing inside the equation I've wrote in the slide before here. OK? So this is, I would say, a quite of a interpretation of extension of a Heston type model. In a, in a full, more classical setting. Um, other examples of this, uh, so you see in here, you have this Z written again as a Y and then normalized just to match this uh, requirement. And, uh, and then in this case, you can really write it down as a square root of the variance. So as I have said, but one can also choose other things like just a fixed element in that case, of course, with a norm equal to one, in which case you would have a little bit of a different variation to the same model. Okay, so in this case, we call this a stochastic volatility model of the Heston type because of this square root. And then you have that Y is what I will call then the volatility process in the, in the, in the talk. Okay, so other thing I can say is that because of the nice shape of these two equations, we have an explicit solution uh, of this type written in terms of the, um, semi-groups associated, and uh, all this is a well-known theory. And uh, what is uh, studied uh, is uh, the representation of some quantities of interest that can describe better this model. In particular, one can also derive this uh, covariance operator associated to the main e um, X equation, and you have an explicit formula for that which is in terms, again, of the semi-group, and it is in terms of the covariance of the Brownian motion, the Z, and this variance process here. So all these are formulae that are derived by brute force computation based on the fact that you have an explicit solution. Oh, wait, sorry, I'm, what happened? I missed it. Huh. Okay, it's coming back. Okay, uh, again, in, because of this uh, specific shape and the fact that we are working with this uh, space uh, HW, then we can write also the adjoint operator of S and has a particular shape which can be written. And as you see here, you have uh, the identification of, uh, the, uh, of this uh, object by means of the weight function of the space. So what is the philosophy here? More than to look at the specific formula that can be read otherwise, is to look at them and, and know that this is a, a model where you can do a lot, quite a, some computation and thus derive some explicit formula. So it's a model that allows for some work further. This is maybe the most important thing to remember. Now I would like to come to the specific of the forward prices because our aim is to study derivatives of the forward prices, since the forward prices are basically the, the observable object in the market. 
And um, in that sense, the forward price, as you see, I'm discussing and writing down directly the Murciela notation, is represented as the evaluation at X, at the time to delivery of this uh, X capital, this model here. So this is how the forward price is defined. And this is going to be our major object of study. Now, FTX, of course, is the time to delivery meant instantaneous delivery. From little f, you move to the G, which is the period delivery with the formula I've shown before, that is the standard type formula we have that connects the two of them. So in here is just the mea simply in substitution. And then we call this, this uh, integral with this uh, script I for uh, short uh, writing, where you see that the elements are X, the time to delivery, the D, the period of delivery, and this X capital that is the dynamic we have underlying. So this is the forward price over the delivery period and the forward price at this any point to maturity X. Right, in between in here, I also brought down some information about the covariance. So because of the work that I've been briefly introduced, uh, introduced in the few slides before, we have an explicit formula for the covariance between the F at two points of delivery. So this shows the intercorrelation within the, the delivery periods, right? Okay. Now, um, what can we say about this uh, integral functional here? Hmm? Uh, the work that uh, has come out is showing that, uh, okay, this is a, a bounded and linear operator. That was not a very big surprise given the shape and the construction already implemented of the evaluation functional. And that's kind of the power of the use of this specific space. And uh, in but the other thing is that it can be represented again with a Ritz representation by a term, which this time it's denoted HXD, which is fully explicit. So it means that we have a representation of these prices over the delivery period by means of one element. And this is the element, the, the, the formula of which is uh, it's here. I mean, it's a matter of computations. So the forward price, the integral shape, and the Ritz representation with explicit element of representation. Right, so all this is the representation of the price. Now a little bit of philosophy around this analysis of the Greeks, if you want. So this is, uh, of course, uh, you know, it's uh, very powerful and it's used a lot, specifically in relationship with the very many basic type of uh, models. But here we have the idea of exploring what is the meaning of this delta within this type of infinite dimensional models. And the issues are two folded. One is the infinite dimensional aspect. And the other is really what is the meaning of uh, sensitivity to a whole volatility process in some way. And uh, so typically you have all these Greek names and, and not so Greek, but doesn't matter. They all come together called the Greeks. So you call Delta this uh, evaluation of the sensitivity to the initial value. Now, this is particularly interesting in complete markets uh, and Brownian and uh, Geomet Black and Scholl modeling, because then is also linked to a hedging issue, which is of course not the case anytime you depart from the complete case. But uh, the other side is that uh, it's a little bit interesting because often even the initial value is quite unknown. There is a lot of uncertainty about it. 
and to see how the derivatives, the financial derivatives on these models change with respect to the parameters is of course of general interest. So uh, in here, the infinite dimensional aspect has been interpreted by infinite dimensional tag derivatives. And that uh, seems to be the, the, the classical thing to do. Then you can start thinking which type of derivatives, because of course you can have Frechet derivatives that are very global or directional derivatives, which are the ones we are going to use in fact, because the perturbation of interest can be more defined along some interesting variations to the topic, because in reality, not all is achievable in this, uh, even from data. When it comes to the volatility, here there is nothing really natural to think of. So to be starting from somewhere, we have taken the sensitivity to the data of this volatility model, which means the initial element Y0 for that model and the um, eta, which was the operator in front of the Brownian motion. If you allow me, I go back some slides so that you remember what I talk about. So you see, this is the eta and the y zero and the x zero is here, right? So these are the elements to which we are studying the sensitivity. Now, be careful to one element that x zero and y zero are functions in H, okay? So it is not a number. But this eta is a full operator. So the flavor, when we talk about directional derivatives of x0 and y0 is a bit similar. They are a bit nested differently within the, the, the model. But this eta is of a different nature compared to this. OK, so that is the thing to remember. OK, I just go to reach where I was. And I was here, so now we can read this one together. And uh, in, uh, in, in uh, this, uh, and now I have to introduce some notation again, because what we have here are um, options, basically. There is financial derivatives, whatever they are, with a payoff, which is denoted by phi, and, uh, and they act on the forward prices. So you see here, that is the typical shape of the price of those objects. Now, remember two things. Well, first uh, here I've taken uh, interest rate R fixed, so that's not my analysis issue. The other thing that you may be surprised if you are not into the electricity setting is that here I've taken the same probability P. In, uh, in, of course, you can choose any other probability, but this is associated to the fact that what we are interested in is the martingality of the measure is not risk neutral in the same way you think in mathematical finance, classic financial markets, because there is no hold and sell strategy with hold part. Everything happens instantaneously when you have electricity, which means to the extent that you can have very well even negative prices in electricity. Uh, and there are, um, so um, that's not to be surprised there. So now at this moment, it's just denoted by P what I'm talking. Okay, the next thing to remember is, well, here it's a bit of a summary of the notation we have seen. So little g is the Murciela notation. Here, the script I is the integral form for this G in the representation we have seen. And of course, you are making the composition of these two objects. And at the end of the day, I'm just collecting this decomposition and call it Psi. Mm -hmm. So of course, when you start from Phi, you have to, we'll, we will have to make some evaluation on the hypothesis, but bear a little bit of patience. And here we have this Psi at the moment and is Psi acting on the X. That's what we have to remember in substance. Now this Tau, this Tau here is the exercise time of the option, right? So we have a lot of times here. Little T is running. T1, T2 delivery period the size of which is D, 
And tau is the exercise time. Now the exercise time of an option in the electricity market is always before or equal to T1. Basically, in the moment there is delivery started, game over. That's the basic rule. Okay, so now what, oh, again, this is, right. So in here, this is, again, this was just a summary for this state of the art that we have here. This is the value of X at tau. And this is exactly the explicit formula that you have substituting the solution of Y into the X. Mm -hmm. So the different colors are just to, to see them in blocks. So this is the Y, this in, in uh, whatever, red maybe, and purple is the block that gives the gamma, that is the volatility in front. Uh, and then here is uh, the, the, the black part is just the X. Okay, so the first, what we want to do is to study the derivatives. It will be the uh, directional derivatives with respect to either x0 or y0 or eta of this object and to give some representation of that. So the philosophy is the same you see in all uh, sensitivity analysis approaches. So here you go, you have the derivative, and this is written with respect to the, eight, the x, for example, and you see the price here is the price, you keep fixed y and eta and you study x. In this case, you keep fixed x and y and you study eta. So that is uh, to for, compactify the reading right now. And uh, as we said, they are directional derivatives, and this is the perturbation that is applied. Mm -hmm. So, uh, meaning it's uh, just what you read. So that is not a, a surprise mm -hmm. in this uh, sense. So, okay, mm, let's see how we can approach this uh, study. The I would like to put a little bit of notice on uh, something in here just for the moment. So you have, you see, this is the perturbation and the perturbation of the X, the same is for the Y, is within the space, where this is the Filipovich space. But the perturbation of the eta, which is an operator, has to be in an operator space. So I, you, it's written now in red, you see the difference, this is straight and this is italic. And we can describe this in a second. Right, so um, let me see what are the uh, ingredients of the study. So what we would like to do is to see if we can make this representation that uh, if you want has uh, ancestors in the work of uh, uh, Lasri and uh, co-authors uh, to see if one can give a nice writing of this directional derivative. We shall see that this is going to be a partial story said, but there are some intrinsic limitations. And one thing is the relationship between Frechet and Malleven derivatives, uh, which has of course to be exploited and then implemented in the specific directions of interest with directional derivatives. That's the first thing. The second is the duality between score of the integral and Malleven derivative. And this is very fine. But the element that makes a big trouble is the chain rule. Because in infinite dimensional spaces, we don't really have a chain rule all the time. And as far as we know, the most largely applicable uh, framework is to have a chain rule for the so-called UMD spaces. Now, these UMD spaces are uh, linked to the specific way the martingales and the decay of martingales difference is um, embedded into the Banach norm. The point is that we don't have UMD spaces. Uh, our spaces, these linear bounded operators on uh, this uh, Hilbert space, this is not reflexive 
And then we know for sure that these are not the UMD Banach spaces. And so far, we don't have a chain rule beyond that framework. So uh, in this case, uh, to see what we can do, and so I've pointed out just now an open question. We cannot address this question within this talk because we, we should have to study now on this other framework of mathematics. But uh, what we can do is to refrain the study of this eta to Hilbert space, Hilbert Smith operators. And in this case, then we can apply the chain rule. So this curly H that I've presented in this setting is the only setting where we can at the moment study the perturbation of the operator so that we can effectively apply a whole nice machinery of calculus. So it's a limitation of the, it, it's an interesting limitation of infinite dimensional analysis at the very moment, the powerful of calculus, as a, I can see it at least. Okay, so this is a, an important element for you to remember. Now I am proceeding quite quickly to another problem. Uh, that we have. And the fact that uh, in general, you see, we have, uh, I have written quite uh, easily this uh, uh, derivative with respect to x0, with respect to y0, but these are functions. And these functions are substantially linked to the past. It's the initial status, but it's uh, the past compared to the dynamic that goes into the future, right? And uh, the direct application of Malyavan calculus with the ideas coming from the finite dimensional setting of Lasry and co-authors is actually concealed because uh, the Malyavan derivative would show what is happening in relationship to the future directions. So in order to try to find a solution, we have implemented a randomization of the paths. And uh, this comes into a technical aspect of having even two spaces. I mean, this is just a formal slide to how to implement such an idea. But you can imagine that intuitively what we are doing is that we are kind of shaking the initial condition. And what we are doing is to shake this in a random manner by the use of a new Brownian motion which is denoted by bold W here. So you have the original setting of where the model lives with B and W, and then you have this bold element, which is again another Brownian motion and a Gaussian process. So technically speaking, you have that if uh, you want to write it down precisely in the computations, every element is now interpreted in this way. Hmm? Okay, fine. So our elements of Malyavan calculus are going to be referred to this W here. And now that we have a proper framework to reveal the role of this permutation, we have a, a whole plan. And the plan goes as follows. We have four parts and I'm going to show you the the light motif between these four parts. So the first thing is that we consider uh, at the moment functions that are Lipschitz and in a way that we can compute the Frechet derivatives. So we do this because it becomes the core element so that we can compute derivatives and exploiting the bounds of Psi and the form of X. Then we introduce the randomization so that we can play around with the relationship between Malyavan and Frechet derivatives. And then we can specify our randomization uh, so that we can effectively compute the Greeks we are interested with. And finally, we want to release on the assumptions up here. And I will discuss how to release on the Frechet differentiability only briefly. So that's the plan. And the plan is uh, 
basically implemented with uh, a little bit of uh, hardcore computations. But as I said, the ingredients are very few uh, and have to be used in a little bit of a maybe clever way, but locally clever way. The um, Frechet derivative of X is explicitly given because X is rather explicit. And here it is. So you, I have all the results written with one, two, and three because they relate to the derivative with respect to the X, the Y, or the eta. And the X and the Y are um, always a kind of a, you know, chain up a similar type of computations. The eta, as I have already anticipated, is a bit more involved. But you can have this explicitly given and you will obtain such results. I remind that U is the generate the, the semigroup in, inside the um, volatility structure. Okay, now um, this is directly the Frechet of X. If Y is Lipschitz and Frechet differentiable, so these are very strong assumptions. Hmm, where by all means, we are aware of this, then you can effectively perform a full computation of the derivatives. And they nicely appear as expectation of derivatives, which is an important element because it's the first step towards the possibility of some implementation where I understand you are, can be shrivery when I say implementation of infinite dimensions, but we have a little plan for that and I can discuss this briefly if interested for someone. So um, this is what you obtain. So what we prove is that we effectively can have the derivative inside basically. And it's the derivative of the composition with respect to H and this is the permutation. So that's how it is written. Now, the second part, we want to rewrite this expectation in a better format. And to do this, we have used this new Brownian motion coming in. And here is where the chain rules are important to be used. And here is also the relationship between the Malyavin derivative and the Frechet derivative in here. So this theorem, which is due to Pronk and Verar, is uh, linked to, well, you have two Hilbert spaces, you have a function between the two of them, which is the Frechet differentiable, and you see also continuous and with bounded derivatives, then you can conclude a lot of things. And this is exactly the relationship which is at the core of the infinite dimensional application of this calculus. But by that element, we can rewrite, I would like you to start from the result and then go backward. So this is the kind of expe expectations we had so far. You can rewrite them as evaluations of Skorohod integrals. Now, the formula look ugly. I only agree with you. And uh, the, what is the element we are looking here? This is the novelty. Hmm? So the fact that you obtain a Skorhoi integral is due to the duality between derivative and integral. So that's not a big surprise. The fact that here you have all these elements, in particular the Xi is because of the randomization. So the shake by randomization. Now let's go to read a little bit what we mean by that. So we have an element which is Malyavin differentiable with derivative non-zero, that's important because as you see, it appears at the bottom, and which is in connection with this H of X. Remember, this is the element representing the X capital, uh, the element uh, the, from the Ritz representation. This is uh, the score, this has to be scorehood integrable. And we shall make an evaluation of this object at the point one over Xi. So even though this is the very uh, undigestible, this is actually the whole core of the argument. The, uh, the possibility to represent these three 
derivatives with these scorehood integrals. But what we do this for is that we don't use any psi. We have a very precise idea of what psi should be. And this is exactly written here. It's the exponential of the Brownian motion at the indicator of zero t. This particular element has all the properties that I have not really read, but they are all stated in here, and they satisfy all of them. Also, it's very easy, it's an exponential, so you can do a lot of computations with them. And in fact, in that case, we can have the exact representation of the um, elements, the derivatives that represent this sensitivity we had in mind, the derivative in the directions with x, y, and eta as well, using exactly this infinite dimensional chain rule a la um, Verart, uh, Veraren, Pronk. And um, so when in this formula we read xi, the xi is this one that you see in here. So this is basically the, the core result for us in the representation. Naturally, under these very um, strong assumptions of Lipschitz continuity and Fréché differentiability. So um, it's difficult for us to get completely out of them at the moment, because there is a lot of need to control these uh, quantities. But one thing we can do is to extend on the Fréché differentiability. Uh, uh, and to do this, we use some idea we had already experimented in some other infinite dimensional analysis we had with uh, my colleagues, uh, David Banyos and Hans Hafekorn and Frank Proske in an early work where, with completely different intent that was for pathwise equations. But the point was that we could, in fact, approximate these kind of payoffs by functions of the type I've just discussed. And we use approximation techniques to go beyond this Fréché differentiability. Actually, these approximations for the people more involved in functional analysis are of this Moro Yoshida type approximation. And there is a whole, hmm, there's a set of results linked to the limits of those type of approximations. And so this is a kind of ideas behind. The other big problem, of course, is uh, um, the substantial Lipschitzianity. And that one, we don't have yet a good approach. But again, we hope that with some approximation technique, we can say more about that as well. The problem of these things is that even though it is not easy, but maybe relatively possible to, structure, to structure up an approximation, is very difficult to prove that the limit, though existing, is yet representing exactly what you wanted. And uh, this is, the, again, a kind of limitation at the moment, or open question, if you want. So I'm stopping here. Uh, and um, yes, this is um, the talk is based on this paper. And uh, the, here is a little bit of reference of the major uh, elements I have uh, maybe put out in the talk, but of course in the paper you have more. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. It's time for questions or comments. Are there any questions? Oral or by chat? Yes, maybe uh, Julia, I have a, a couple of questions, maybe curiosity. Okay. The first one is uh, uh, you explained very, very well the need of uh, a randomization uh, to deal uh, with the initial uh, value. But does uh, the choice of ra randomization, uh, for instance, the one you choose the, is uh, quite natural, I would say, does affect uh, uh, so much the result? Uh, do, what do you think? Or if you tried the different one? And the second is also, I think that uh, uh, I agree with you that the problem of uh, 
finding the class uh, in order to compute the vega, so uh, where eta belong, is uh, quite difficult. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, the possibility to have the chain rule uh, is not trivial. So this is a, a very important point. So the Hilbert-Schmidt uh, is, uh, again, a quite natural uh, choice. I perfectly agree. And uh, things work well. But did you find some, uh, let's say, interesting example outside? I don't know if uh, you understand what I mean. Some pathological, not in Hilbert Schmidt space, uh, example that uh, tells us uh, there is really a need apart from uh, the uh, clearly the, the generality, but. Uh, that put you, let you go outside this class. Mm -hmm. I don't know if uh, yes. I, I was clear. Yes, Probably yes. No, no, you've clear. been very clear. And um, I, I, am, I, I will not be exhaustive in my answers because uh, I honestly, we, it's um, very difficult to, to do something uh, explicitly so that you can also test the uh, outside your boundaries situation, so to speak, because often things end up existing if you study something, but not existing if you study something else. Let me start from your last question, for example. From the modeling point of view, we don't need Hilbert Schmidt at all in the eta. And that would be nice, fine with any operator of course it needs to have uh, this uh, the, the solution needs to be there etc so but uh, i mean the, the the basic assumptions i gave at the beginning and uh, if one is trying to test this versus the um, model so to try to reconstruct the model this is uh, something which is not yet done again, because of course, in principle, it would go a bit like this. So this, the, the plan, let's say, how it would go. You have some evaluations of the forward prices. These are available in the market. They are real data. Hmm? But then you need to create a forward curve in continuous setting. And this one can in principle be done, and this is implemented in other setting, also not necessarily the volatility I have now here, but it is implemented by, um, I think they call it smoothing the curve. That is the terminology used, which to me means basically that you're doing a big interpolation using, for example, splines. Hmm? Okay, so at the end you have all these nice uh, forward curves. Fair enough. And then from there you start talking about how to, to find this volatility, because uh, in principle, that's not, of course, observable. So then there is all this uh, technique, which is a plan of implementation, except that then we didn't have convergence results. So latest, it's um, uh, Fred with um, Almut Verart, not the same Verart, I'm talking about the different names, and uh, Dennis Schroes, another PhD with us, and uh, to study a low of large numbers. So via these low of large numbers, we can basically see that they are realized the volatility can converge to the volatility, basically. And that's already a first step, but it does not require Hilmer Schmidt, for example. But then if you do calculus, so you take the model to say, okay, now I have a forward, not only just to see to have direct prediction on the forward price, but I use them inside other financial pro products to say something of these other products, then immediately you have to use stochastic calculus. And then you need much more assumption, including these type of things, because otherwise you don't have uh, that the operators are finite or you don't know how to study them. Or... And then immediately you end up there. So have we tested beyond this? Not yet really, because uh, depending what we have, what was the, what is the question, immediately we need some more assumptions and we don't know how to do without them. But in principle, they are mathematical assumptions, not uh, um, objective potentials assumptions coming from the problem, so to speak. 
So this is uh, coming to your Hilbert Schmidt, which of course uh, we didn't find any other fantasy of idea, maybe a person with a lot more uh, financial uh, functional analysis, also technique and application can see also other spaces uh, to use. But um, would those cho choices, and I come to your first question, be a matter of robustness? I think they, um, they are ha heavily exploited here. So the Filipovich space, no matter what W is chosen provided is in the class, is an intrinsic part of the modeling. So how would you choose a better W compared to another one? I don't think the question has ever been posed in this way. At the moment it's posed, let's find one with which we can do a lot more, which is maybe not the correct mathematically posed, but at the moment it makes us get along with things. Hmm? And in here for the randomization, the study of this result that I go back, uh, now I stopped here, but you see the, the aim of writing this in such a general format and then take it specific was exactly to try to see if there was a need for, um, if you are affected by this randomization. The result says that it does not, uh, is not important. This result, so you see the left-hand side is not depending on psi, the right does. So the representation depends on the randomization, but not the result. And this is nice because then we can choose the one that better fits. And for us to find that this simple one satisfies all possible conditions, is uh, fantastic, right? But uh, in principle, you can find another one, of course, satisfying the conditions, but then the result should not change because the, represent the left hand side is really not depending on this randomization. So it becomes really only a technical tool, which is nice because in this way, we know that at least on this setting, we, can, we have a freedom we have the mathematical freedom to implement the computations. I add at the moment, since these computations are not easy peasy to us, then we have chosen the, the, the choices that made our life easier. Maybe other choices would have been um, reflecting other aspects, I don't know. So this is- uh, Yes, I, I understand now. Yes, uh, the formula is the same. So probably the choice of the randomization uh, just affect uh, the uh, say efficiency variance uh, or so on. Yes, it exactly. It's pretty yes. similar the how do you perform the integration by part probably. Yes, yeah. in fact, uh, one um, work that um, is uh, coming up in the idea is that you know that uh, similar techniques cannot be implemented in the jump case because you don't have a chain rule is really at best a different rule, differ, difference rule. And also it's, um, it, you enter into a complication of uh, the role between jumps and Gaussian element, if any. But we have studied this earlier on in the finite dimensional setting using some kind of conditioning techniques and some kind of um, approximation, I'll, if you want motivated by, if you want to go back, you take Asmussen and Rosinski, no? just to, to mention the first one. So what is it? What is the, to, to start to make a philosophy between what is a small jump compared to a variation of the Brownian motion, right? And there we can give a representation of the deltas. Hmm? The representation are different according to the different interpretation, but they all represent the same delta. And exactly is the efficiency of the numerical technique in variance reduction. In the finite dimensional case, it's proved. In the infinite, uh, we are still in the land of... Uh, Thank you very much. There are a lot of interesting uh, ideas. So thank you for your talk. Okay, thank you. I think it's time for next speaker. So, uh, Christoph. Hi. Uh, hi, you are here. Okay. So uh, next speaker and last speaker this morning is Christoph Reisinger from University of Oxford. 
if you project your first slide. Okay. Can you see? Okay. Yes, we see. Yes, perfect. Perfect. The Thank title you. Is arbitrage free neural stochastic differential equations market models. So, uh, Christoph, when you want. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to start by apologizing for the confusion this morning. So I'm truly sorry for everybody who went on the call and, and, and then um, ha had nothing. And I'm especially sorry for the organizers to put them through this stressful situation at the start of the workshop. So I'm really sorry. This may that. happen. It's just one hour. It's very easy to. <laughs> You're very generous. So, so thanks very much um, and for accommodating me at this time. Um, so um, yeah, the title of the talk is Arbitrage Through Neural SD Market Models. Um, so if you are put off by any words in this title, please uh, bear with me and at least wait for the, for the next slide where I'll talk you through the different um, components of our modeling. So for one thing, we're looking at market models. So I will look at models for um, whole books of derivatives, um, so called market models. Um, we'll do that by modeling um, high dimensional systems of SDs um, and uh, neural networks here only come in through um, the fact that we're looking for um, as far as possible um, model free um, uh, representation of the, of the prices and neural networks have good properties, especially in high dimensions. But um, if you don't like neural networks, you could replace it um, by any polynomials or other function approximators. And finally, we have to make sure that our simulated models, um, they are as far as possible arbitrage free. So this is joint work with my colleague, um, Sam Cohen um, from the Mass Finance Group in Oxford um, and our joint uh, PhD student, um, Victor Wang. So Victor is um, sponsored by the CME Group, the Chicago uh, Mercantile Exchange. And they came to us um, with the brief to come up with simulation models that allow them to take um, historical data and to um, simulate realistic versions um, of, these, of these events into the future with the goal to compute risk figures. Um, so potentially um, further, further into the future, but um, to maintain as many of the stylized properties of these um, uh, time series as, as possible. So to give realistic um, ways of managing the risks but also you might be interested in using these models for the, the books of um, liquid um, vanilla products to then risk manage price and hedge um, more liquid exotic derivatives. So the idea is to come up with a, as far as possible non-parametric model um, for, and in this talk I will restrict myself to options on a, on a single underlying, think of something like an equity index like the S&P 500, um, where you have a very large pool of options with different strikes and maturities. So we will come up with a model to simulate the dynamics of these options books um, under consideration of the, um, of the economic constraints on relationships um, between, between these options. So the first thing to do is um, given that um, derivatives with different strikes and maturities um, on the same underlying are clearly highly dependent and um, so we'll have to restrict the possible state space where this high dimensional vector of option prices lives um, to, a, to, to a fairly small constrained um, subset of the space. Um, and in particular, we're interested in maintaining um, static arbitrage conditions, which uh, translate into model free arbitrage, um, which in our mind is more important um, than um, dynamic arbitrage, which depends on, on the model that you use. So we want to do something fairly model free, and therefore we're interested in, in static constraints. And what that means is that, um, for instance, if you have options, um, two call options with two different strikes, um, you have a certain ordering between them, you have positivity, etc. So we'll find that um, they're liable state vectors, um, they live in a certain um, fairly um, squashed polytope in a high dimensional space. And we want to learn dynamics that stays within this, within this region. And we'll do that by looking at the historical time series, which are discrete. And we want to learn uh, an SDE model, um, which stays within this allowable region. And to do that, we'll write down um, a system of SDEs um, for a factor representation for this options book. And um, we parameterize um, the coefficients by neural networks, um, which um, 
of course contain hyperparameters, but um, it's, a, it's, it's an overparameterized um, representation of these coefficients. And we want to learn the dynamics as much as possible only from the data without putting in model assumptions. And um, we think a main advantage of um, this, this, this procedure is um, that it is a practical approach um, because we only build our model on observable data. Um, it is um, eventually after sort of pre-processing, it only draws on fairly standard um, tools that are available in uh, packages like, like TensorFlow. Um, but we also use a lot of sort of the traditional math finance and stochastic machinery of stochastic differential equations. So we'll get something which is interpretable in this sense. And we use tools um, that we're familiar with from mathematical finance. So to put this um, work into uh, sort of the bigger picture of work that has been done on uh, model-free um, learning in derivatives markets, of course, um, there's work dating back um, 20 years now, um, already in the 90s, where people tried to use um, machine learning methods to predict derivative prices um, from observable features like um, the underlying price, um, potentially moneyness, time to maturity, and then come up with a, with a machine learned model um, that would predict um, prices um, from, from new observations of these features. And I'm not going to go into detail here. I'd like to just refer you to um, a paper from last year, which is a survey by Johannes Ruf and um, his student, where they compiled a quite um, impressive and comprehensive survey of, um, of, of literature um, that has looked at um, especially um, deep learning and hedging methods um, that, have been, that have been proposed. And um, so they classified these works um, almost like a like a, like, a, like a biologist would classify um, plants and animals in terms of what are the input features, what is the output, um, what is the thing that you learn, um, what have these, which benchmarks have these papers used in terms of the pricing or hedging, which performance measures, et cetera, et cetera. How do they use um, the, um, the training set and the, and the testing set and, and what underlying they use. So it's a, um, it's a very useful compendium um, if you want to get into this type of area. So our work differs in the sense that um, we're interested not just in um, learning a model, but in terms of um, simulating this model into the, into the future. So some recent work um, in this area um, is on the one hand, um, sort of more parametric work. So this first paper that I'm listing here by Christian Bayer and his co-authors, um, they look at using um, neural networks basically as approximating a mapping that goes from the model parameters and underlyings um, to, the, to the prices. And the use is mostly as a tool, as an efficient tool of calibration, because once you have trained this model, you have just a neural network to evaluate to get prices. So if you use that as part of a calibration routine, um, which is an iterative procedure, um, you get potentially a massive, a massive speed up. Um, but they still live very much in a, um, in a, in a model world. So only use neural networks as computationally efficient tools. So closer to our work um, are the following two references, one by um, Krista Kukiero and, um, and her co-authors. So they use neural networks to represent um, coefficients in SDs. And in particular, they look at um, so-called local stochastic volatility models, which um, uh, I think most of you will be familiar with. So you have um, a hybrid between a stochastic volatility, but also as we saw in the previous talk, but also with a local volatility component, um, which uh, in the Dupier sense, um, and they represent this by neural network um, and, and learn this um, by uh, a learning approach from, from, from time series. Even more model independent is, is the, the, the second work here um, by Lukas Spruch and some of his co-authors um, where they basically write down uh, an over-parameterized model for the underlying using an SD with neural network coefficients, uh, which is the similarity to the previous work. And um, both these papers have coined the, the, the phrase neural SDs as referring to SDs where the coefficients um, are, are neural networks, but they're just standard SDs um, with a sort of functional, um, functional coefficients. Um, and they um, used um, the observed derivative prices to then learn this, learn this model. So where our model crucially differs from these works is that um, these papers are still very much in the Martingale pricing approach. So you write down 
a potentially complicated over-parameterized model for your underlying. And then the map from the, the underlying to the derivative prices is given by um, arbitrage arguments, um, basically to compute risk neutral expectations. So this is still very much a Martingale approach um, for, the, for the pricing. Whereas we look at, at market models where we um, learn directly the whole system of um, casts for the, for the underlying and the option prices simultaneously. So in some sense, um, this um, creates extra difficulties because um, the, the Martingale pricing approach is arbitrage free by, by construction, whereas we have to work on um, constructing suitable state spaces and um, maintaining arbitrage restrictions uh, within, within our model. So to give you an idea of what we are talking about, um, the, the sort of the type of data that would be typical. So I'm giving you here a representation of um, a, a foreign exchange market. So in particular, this is for um, the Euro US dollar exchange rate. And um, these are now representations of derivatives that would be traded on the, on this CM exchange. Um, so each dot, um, let me maybe start with the left panel here. So each dot here represents a derivative that is traded for a certain strike, which is the horizontal coordinate and a certain expire, which is the vertical coordinate. So um, I guess a few important features are that um, you have um, for short maturities, um, the strikes are more concentrated around the current spot price, which here would be just under 1.2. Um, and then um, for longer maturities, um, you have a bigger spectrum of traded strike, strikes that sort of go around, um, around that, um, sort of in and out of the money options. And there, there, there's quite a lot of, um, of traded options um, and um, they are not equally spaced. So a lot of works um, in terms of arbitrage conditions between option prices assume that you have sort of a lattice of prices that um, the, the strikes that are traded for each maturity are the same. And of course we see that this is far from being the truth there. Um, a, a second way of looking at this is um, to look at not in terms of a strike coordinate, but at a, at a moneyness coordinate. Um, so that somehow normalizes things because if I look at the, the log moneyness defined as the log of the strike divided by a forward, then we see that things are now centered around zero. And that will be a useful representation for us um, because um, if we want to model the evolution of these contracts, it makes sense to look at coordinates um, um, which um, are sort of centered around a certain value in this case, in this case zero, and things become a bit more um, symmetrical here. And just to also maybe point out in uh, exchange, foreign exchange markets, um, there's a convention of often um, quoting option prices in terms of so-called deltas. Um, so the way this works is that instead of um, having the strike as input, you convert the strike um, via the Black Scholes implied volatility into a certain delta. And then um, if the delta of an option say is, um, is 50%, um, then you quote this as a um, as an open 50% um, delta option. Um, so it's a very convoluted indirect way of quoting the prices. So, and you see that here, then you get sort of 10% delta options, 50% delta options, maybe 70% delta options, et cetera. And, uh, and this spreads the prices out a bit more over the, uh, the range between zero and one, which are the allowable deltas. Okay, so these are the prices, but um, I think the main point I want to make is first, um, that it makes sense um, to look at a transformation to moneyness, and the second that um, there's quite a, quite a lot of prices and um, they, they, of course, they evolve in a highly dependent way. So if you look at, um, maturities here of maybe of, um, of a month or so, you have, um, you have a lot of dots here concentrated. And if one of these dots moves, then the other move dots can't move independently because you have to maintain certain monotonicity and other conditions. So to, to drill into this a bit further, um, I want to um, just spend uh, a few minutes um, of talking about um, these arbitrage restrictions because they will be quite important ingredients for our model. So it is clear that derivative prices have to see, stay positive. Um, they also have to maintain monotonicity in the strike. So if you have two call options, um, then the option with the, the larger strike um, will have a smaller price than the one with the, the smaller price. And these are model-free constraints because otherwise it's easy for a trader to exploit this arbitrage um, without making any assumptions about the underlying model. And the final, const uh, 
further constraints contain um, the convexity. So um, for instance, um, if you um, had, um, uh, so, so let me maybe talk you through um, these, these, these graphs here. Um, so, um, so this is um, a sketch for possible crisis um, here, a cartoon for strike crisis, different strikes. Um, are sort of these solid circles here. Um, and um, so I'm showing you here that um, be between these dots, um, there's only a certain allowable region where um, options with um, different strikes would be allowed to fall. And if they did not, um, then you could um, construct what is called a butterfly arbitrage that by a certain trade, which goes um, goes short and long, um, gives certain strikes, um, you could create um, a risk-free profit. So um, that is to say that um, the, um, the, the, the curve of prices, which are plotted as a function of strike has to be has to be convex, um, and also in a, in a discrete sense. So if you have a discrete prices, um, a certain linear combination of these prices um, with certain weights has to be has to be positive. And um, so, between um, all these different traded options here, I'm showing you sort of these light green regions, um, which um, maintain um, this this convexity constraint. But of course, now if you also combine this with monotonicity. Um, then you basically cut off the top of all of these regions. Um, you cut off a big rectangle, and you see that the allowable prices fall within a fairly small segment. And on top of that, if you now have different maturities, you get certain monotonicity in, in maturity as well. Um, so we'll see ultimately that we have a number of constraints. And what's convenient is that all these constraints um, are basically linear inequalities. So you get a linear combination of prices which has to have a certain sign. Um, so that could be the positivity itself. There could be monotonicity where compared two prices or convexity where you have three prices and then you have certain sort of cross convexity between strike and maturity. So you might have maybe six prices involved, but um, all combined, um, you um, can write everything as a big system of linear inequalities. And of course that means that um, the, the vector of prices um, lies in an intersection of half spaces because each of these inequalities defines a half space and um, the allowable prices which um, maintain these static arbitrage conditions are the intersection of these half spaces so you get a convex polytope in a potentially high dimensional space. So in the previous picture we had a few hundred options so you'd be looking at a uh, maybe at a 400 dimensional space but the allowable prices have to lie within a certain a certain region. Okay, so um, maybe a bit more um, on how we represent um, these prices. So um, it first makes sense um, to, um, if you want to have a fairly sort of stationary model that we can learn from historical time series um, to write things in terms of time to maturity, rather to have separate time and maturity as inputs. Um, we're just focusing on a time to maturity variable. And I hope I already convinced you that, um, that looking at moneyness is a, is a good idea because then we can sort of hope that um, if we model options within um, a certain range of moneyness, um, that they will be liquidly traded as we go forward. So what we therefore do is that um, we pick a certain number of, um, of liquid maturities where we have a lot of options traded. And um, for each of these maturities, we observe a certain range where um, strikes are liquidly traded as well. So this is um, what I'm showing you in the right-hand panel here, that um, these black dots um, would be observed option prices, um, which have a, um, a high enough volume to be traded that we trust the prices. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to model the evolution of, of these prices as we go forward. And so we have, we're fixing the moneyness um, and we're fixing the time to maturity. And we're thinking of this as a fixed contract and um, we're basically propagating the prices on these black dots um, into the future. So we've restricted potentially um, the, the, the picture from, from, from this slide where we had hundreds um, and we pick um, a range of maybe um, more, more like 50 different option prices which span these regions and we model the evolution. So that's sort of the formula I'm showing you here at the bottom that we're looking at uh, a rescaled version of the derivative prices. So instead of looking at um, CT of capital T and K, which would be an option price, a time series um, for fixed major and fixed strike. Um, we're translating these prices into having a, a certain time to maturity and a certain log moneyness. Because otherwise what happens 
um, as I'm showing you on the left-hand panel here, if I look at options um, for different strikes. Um, so for instance, if I look at this green curve here, um, so that would be an option with a strike of 1.3. So because the underlying sort of uh, moved away from moved away from this strike, this option ended up not being traded um, within half a year to its maturity. So it doesn't make sense um, to, to model sort of a coordinate system which has a fixed strike and maturity, but we're modeling a fixed um, moneyness um, because there's hope that these options stay liquid. So it's just to say, so we're looking at these um, sort of transformed option prices where we have on the one hand transformation to um, maturity and, um, and, and moneyness, and on the other hand, we rescale it by the forward. So there's still quite a lot of prices. And um, because of all these restrictions between them, what we're going to do next is um, we're going to look at a certain number of lower dimensional factors that try to capture the dynamics of these prices. So, and this is, uh, I think, an important slide here, um, which um, is sort of at the, at the core of this. So, so we have these transformed option prices. And um, what we're trying to do is um, we're trying to find the most important factors that drive the evolution of this surface. Um, so we have a factor here that um, what we call G0. Um, so if you forget about the rest, um, if you were in a Black-Scholes model, so if the Black-Scholes model was true, then um, in the Black-Scholes formula, you have a dependence only on time to maturity and log moneyness. Um, so if there was no other stochasticity beyond the Black-Scholes model, then this first term here would capture the prices exactly and would be constant in time because we've already scaled out the, the forward dependence, okay? So in uh, the Black-Scholes model, um, these transform prices are basically constant, um, but of course we don't believe in the Black-Scholes model. So to add um, the um, further stochastic terms, um, we project on a number of, of factors. So these factors you could, uh, a priori think of um, any observable quantity. So you could choose, um, for instance, macroeconomic factors, you could choose interest rates, you could choose um, any sorts of things that, that, that you might be interested in. Ultimately, what we're going to do is we're going to reconstruct these factors in a sort of statistical way and by arbitrage considerations from the observed price. So we are going to try to find these factors xi here, um, which will be stochastic processes. To, in, a, in a way that we capture as much as possible from the important features of the, of the, of the option prices. So as a first step, you could just look at principal components, for instance, um, to maximize the variance that is explained in your, in your options book. And then each of them um, will have a certain weight factor attached to them. So we calibrate these weight factors, the GI here. Um, and once we've done that, we will basically simulate um, these, these factors forward. Um, and um, so maybe I'll explain to you now about this, this picture, which is a snapshot of this. So this is on a, um, in a simulated model. Um, we've restricted um, the options book, um, which may contain um, hundreds of options um, here and projected it onto two factors, psi one and psi two. Um, it's not important at this stage um, how we construct um, this, this dimension reduction. So I'll come back to this, come back to this later. So the important thing is that um, we now have these black dots, um, which are essentially um, um, simulated um, values um, over a certain period of time of these, of these factors. And because we have these um, arbitrage constraints on the option prices, and we have a linear transformation, this translates into linear arbitrage constraints on these factors. So, and I've highlighted them here by these, um, these red um, dashed, dashed lines. So the original arbitrage constraints on the prices, which are convexity, um, positivity, monotonicity, um, after the factor transformations, um, they translate into, again, linear, linear um, inequalities. And because I've projected this into a two-dimensional space, um, we just have basically um, an intersection of these, um, these half spaces, which are given by this green shaded region. So if you have calibrated a model, which is arbitrage free, um, the, the simulated black dots here, they have to stay within this green region. Um, so I'll tell you later how we do that, how we calibrate uh, models for these factors um, that stay within, within this region. So before I do that, I'll just show you sort of what could be the output of this. So first um, we define these, um, this factor reduction, and then we um, 
find the, the best representation. So the way we do this is um, that um, we have basically um, three considerations for this. One of them is um, that we want to capture statistical properties, um, volatility, for instance, um, of, the, um, of the option prices and of the underlying. So to capture sort of things like volatility, um, we can perform a, um, a principal component analysis on our price surface. And there's um, various um, papers um, who've done that in the past, for instance, uh, Rama Kant and Fonseca, et cetera, so to, to come up with um, good statistical representations of um, the dynamics of an option price surface. We'll also be interested in um, to, to stay within this, um, this static arbitrage region, no arbitrage region, so I'll um, come back to this in a bit. And finally, we also um, want to um, have um, as much as possible um, no model-based arbitrage within our models. So that is dynamic arbitrage, and that leads us to certain conditions on um, the, the, the drift um, in, a, in, a, in a way um, sort of touched at in uh, Julia's talk earlier, um, that in, in this type of market models, um, you typically encounter certain conditions on the drift. So I'll again explain about this later. So, so ultimately, um, we have this formula here in the middle of the slide that um, the, the call prices are represented by this, this zero factor, which is basically the, um, the black Scholes component, um, the one that only depends on um, that is sort of static in time. And then um, we have this, this matrix of um, G here, which are the weights um, of exposure with respect to certain stochastic factors and um, plus some noise which we want to want to minimize. And this could be sort of an output of it. So, um, so the, the, the zero factor um, is basically just um, a price surface in terms of moneyness and, uh, and time to maturity. So that looks pretty much like a, um, a Black Scholes pricing surface. Um, and then um, you have an exposure to further stochastic factors. And this is of course um, impossible to interpret if I don't tell you what the, what the factors are. Okay, so that's the first step. So um, we, that's purely a, um, a reconstruction step on um, finding the factors for in the historical data that best describe the data. And now to go into the future, what we want to do is we want to simulate them. So we want to learn the model of these, of these factors. And we do that by writing down um, a stochastic differential equation um, for both um, the underlying S here and the additional stochastic factors um, that are, are called xi, and we parameterize them um, by, by certain coefficients. So you have mu and sigma, um, which, depend on, which depend on s, um, the underlying, and on, the, on these additional factors. And again, we try to, to, to basically fit these, um, these coefficients um, by, to minimize any statistical errors, but also make sure that um, the prices stay in the in the no-arbitrage regions. And um, a certain output could be this, this plot here again for um, a reconstruction of two factors that um, um, we um, produce um, a certain um, sort of contour plot of the density of these factors. So we have certain input data which come from a, from a single trajectory um, that we observe as a past time series of these factors. So these would be the, the, the blue curves here. So I'm showing you both the the two marginal distributions of the factors on the right and on top. And I'm also showing you the joint distribution. And, um, and then we learn the coefficients of this, um, of for, these, for these factors and, um, and then simulate them into the future. And then I get the simulated um, densities. And these are the orange curves here. And we see that, um, well, at least qualitatively, we capture the dependence between these factors reasonably well from our learned, our learned so more on this later in the, in the numerical tests. So to come back to um, the, the choice of factors, I have to do a little intermezzo here and go back to explain to you a bit about the, about the dynamic arbitrage. So we started off with option prices um, and we're reducing it to a fairly small number of factors. So you saw that there could be hundreds of traded derivatives on an underlying, but in the end, um, I might be interested in having only two or three or four factors. So of course, um, um, the, the price is predicted by these factors. Um, the, the, I could have introduced um, a lot of arbitrage um, because of all these conditions I have on the prices. Um, so in particular, if I'm also interested in, um, in no dynamic arbitrage, I have to make sure that um, there's a, a risk neutral measure under which um, the, the simulated prices are martingales. So the first thing to notice that um, 
because we are doing calibration from the price time series and the option price time series, I'm calibrating in the physical measure. But to make sure that there's no dynamic arbitrage, I have to ensure that there's an equivalent multiple measure, which of course in this context of SV models um, restricts the allowable drift. So there has to be a market price of risk process such that um, if I add this to my, my, my true drift, um, I, get, um, I get a martingale. And that is of course far from trivial because um, we have to make sure that if we start with our factor process, um, I have a market price of risk for my observed derivative prices. And that is of course a hugely over-parameterized, sorry, under-parameterized system because, um, I, um, uh, because of this high dimensional vector of derivative prices. And if you, if you run through the computation, um, which ensures that um, we have a market price of risk, um, you get a certain equation for this, um, what I call sign here, which contains, um, well, clearly the, the, the drift and the volatility of my factor process. So sigma and mu were the, um, the, the, the volatility and the drift in the, in the, in the factor SD. Um, and then of course, um, what enters is the transformation to the option prices. So that was this matrix G here. Um, so I have to make sure that um, for a certain right hand side, which is given by, um, this vector Z here. So um, I'm not going to, to talk you through the derivation, but basically what you do is um, you transfer, transform from the, from the factors to the derivative prices, um, you apply Eta's formula. So that explains why you have a bunch of derivatives here um, of the option prices. In any case, that's just to say that um, you get a, a, a hugely overdetermined linear system um, um, and um, to have no dynamic arbitrage, you need to have a solution of this system. And to somehow um, to enable that, um, we um, add factors to our factor representation, which are uh, principal components of this process Z here. And the rationale for that is that um, if, um, if the, the vector Z here lies in the span of these matrices G, um, then um, no matter how well determined the system is, um, there, there, there will be a solution of this, um, this market price of risk process. So we try to capture as much as possible of the dynamics of this, of this Z vector. Okay, uh, coming back now to how we learn this model. So um, in, this, in the second step um, where we try to learn this diffusion model, um, we somehow have to make sure that um, the dynamics that we learn stays in this allowable space that I, that, that I showed you here. So we have to learn a diffusion process um, which stays within a certain region. And of course, that is somehow a classical problem. So to do that, what we, what we do is um, we parameterize um, these SD coefficients by neural networks. Um, so um, the construction of neural networks, um, as you will have seen, uh, seen before, is um, so we take as input um, the, um, the, the underlying S and R factors. Um, we transform this by a number of iterations of applying um, linear transformations and activation functions um, to produce a certain output. And that's sort of these last circles here, we have a certain output layer. But of course now um, there's nothing that ensures that these coefficients here um, give us an SD which stays in the, in the allowable domain. So what we therefore do is um, that we transform them in a certain way um, that um, we, satisfy, we satisfy the restrictions. Um, so this is um, what I call this, this output layer here. So from these preliminary coefficients, mu hat and sigma hat, we produce the transformation um, so that the, the learned model um, stays arbitrage free. So um, just going back to um, some basic stochastic calculus. Um, so revisiting the problem, um, we have this convex polytope, um, a high dimensional polytope. We have a stochastic process. So what are the conditions on the SD? So we stay inside this polytope. Something you may have thought about before. Um, so um, there's a classical theory by, by, for instance, Friedman and Pinsky. Um, so if you have an, o, uh, an SD um, with coefficients mu and sigma, so there's two things that have to be satisfied. So in this case, I'm showing you a certain um, sort of distorted rectangle here with four boundaries. Um, so, so first, um, irrespective, um, maybe let me start on the right. Um, so if you have a diffusion process um, and if you get, um, get close to the boundary, um, to make sure that you don't cross the boundary, what has to happen is that the diffusion becomes degenerate. So you're not allowed any volatility across the boundary because no matter what the drift is, otherwise you would have a positive probability of crossing the boundary. So for these um, four boundaries here, 
if I have a certain um, normal vector um, vk onto the case boundary, what I have to make sure is that um, the, the, the diffusion matrix at the boundary is singular and um, the, the vk is a singular vector. So that, that just means that um, the diffusion here acts parallel to the boundary, but not across the boundary. So you need a certain degeneracy of the diffusion matrices as you come to the boundary. And the way we ensure this is that um, we start with our candidate um, sigma. So that's the one that we learn, but um, we project it in a way that um, the matrix becomes singular. So we do that only sort of close to the, close to the boundary. Okay, so the, the normal component of the diffusion um, gets sort of in a layer close to the boundary gets sort of switched off in a, in a continuous way. And once we have that, um, we still have to make sure that um, the drift doesn't take us outside. So intuitively, um, what you need is that you have an incoming drift at the boundary. So you have a certain inequality um, that the projection of the drift onto the, the inward normal vector is, is positive. And the way we ensure that is that, um, so for instance, I'm in the left-hand plot here. If I'm looking at say the, the bottom right boundary, the fourth boundary, which is determined by um, an, an equation involving the, the, the fourth normal vector. So what I do is I pick a point in the interior of the domain, um, something that is as far as possible away from the boundary. So this, this is zeta four point here. And then I modify my, my, my candidate drift, um, which is um, mu hat here. And um, so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm adding a, um, basically a drift that points towards this, this interior point. And if I have a certain weight factor that is large enough, um, that will sort of push the drift inwards. So there's, there's some sure other way, uh, and possibly better ways of doing this. So all we do is um, that we somehow modify our drift so to, to stay inside the domain. Okay, so this is um, a modification um, of, um, of drifts and diffusions, which ensure that we are inside. And the picture that you get is, is sort of the, the following. So this is again, um, the red dashed lines here um, are the boundaries of the region that we want to stay in. So on the left now is um, for simulated data. Um, the green circles here, they represent um, simulated data points and the arrows represent um, the direction of the drift and um, also the, the, the size of the drift. And what you see is that um, what happens is exactly what we want to happen that um, sort of along the, along the boundaries, you get a drift um, which is sort of, sort of parallel to the boundary or inwards. And um, as you go further away, you are unconstrained and your drift um, can, be, can be larger or pointing in different directions. And on the right-hand side, um, so that's for the same simulation, the same boundaries, I'm showing you now um, a representation of the diffusion that is learned. Um, so again, what you want to have is that the diffusion close to the boundaries is parallel to the boundaries. So I'm representing this here by ellipses. So um, the principal components of our um, diffusion matrix um, sort of um, have ellipses here that are scaled with the, the, the principal axis. So an ellipsis that gets sort of squashed um, in a certain direction represents a diffusion that only acts in that direction. Whereas a circle would be an, an isotropic diffusion. And again, we see that um, close to the boundary, the diffusion is, um, is degenerate. So that's exactly um, sort of what we wanted to achieve in, in this transformation. Okay, so once we've done that is, um, so um, within this um, transformation step, we're now trying to fit um, the model to um, the observed time series. And here we do no magic, um, we just um, approximate the SDEs by an Euler scheme. And then um, we, we find that the maximum likelihood estimators of these coefficients, um, mu hat and sigma hat, but bear in mind that then for the simulation, uh, we, 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 we transform them. So we learn these coefficients so as to best, um, uh, for, to maximize the likelihood of the, um, of the bluff prices. And if you, if you do that in your Euler scheme, you get sort of, um, in each time step, you have normal distributions, you write down the, the likelihood of this, um, to observe a certain path. Um, and um, so what you get is certain norms um, of the observed, so the observed crosses here is little y, um, and you get, get certain norms um, with the diffusion matrix, et cetera. So this is just the least squares functional that you get um, for the maximum likelihood estimator um, for, for a certain observed price path. And we minimize that um, um, over, over the, the, these parameters. Here. And uh, I allow the flexibility to maybe have some extra penalty terms so that could 
um, for instance, induce some, some sparsity or some other considerations that you might want to have. And um, so yeah, just um, technical detail. Um, so we have some, some sort of further um, transformations here. So this matrix sigma hat, which is the diffusion matrix. Um, so we restrict ourselves to, to triangular matrices. So to um, respect the, the symmetry. So we have something slightly um, reduced already and um, to ensure some invertibility, um, we um, exponentiate the diagonal, which automatically gives us positive definite um, matrices. But having done that, um, we can now solve an unconstrained optimization problem for these parameters of phi here, which are the neural networks. So <laughs> sort of a, a multi-stage process. So you start with a neural network, um, which has certain hyperparameters, you transform them into the sigma hat and mu hat matrices, and then you do this transformation um, um, that, that, that I've outlined here, that you, that you stay within your, your process stays within a certain domain. Okay, so um, now that I've told you all the ingredients, um, let me just run you through a, a numerical example. So to be able to do a lot of testing, uh, we're not using uh, market data uh, in, in this test here, but um, we're using simulated data. So um, because that allows us to basically generate as many data as we want um, over um, and repeat the, repeat the experiment. Whereas for real data, of course, you only have one shot at, at history. So, so here we use um, simulated data, but we try to generate data that are as realistic as possible. So a popular model in um, FX and also in equities is, um, is the stochastic local volatility model. And in particular here, I'm looking at a, at a Heston dynamic for the stochastic volatility. So here this process new here is um, it's just a CR process um, with a certain mean reverting property and uh, volatility for volatility. And then, um, so I'm looking here at, um, for simplicity at zero interest rates, which is quite um, realistic at the moment. Um, and um, so the, the process for S is now given by the square root of the variance process. And um, what is often referred to as a leverage function, which is a local volatility component. So this function L here, um, is a function of, of time and then of the spot. And I'm showing you the calibrated function here on the right. So there's a plot of this two-dimensional function, which depends on, on calendar time and on the, on the underlying. So I should um, say two things about, uh, about this model. So the first is that um, you may have noticed, so uh, what we're doing is we're calibrating uh, a stationary model here. So there's no explicit time dependence in these coefficients. So unless um, one of your factors is actually time, um, the, uh, this model here is not within the, the, the class of models that we are considering because we're trying to learn something that has certain stationarity properties to be able to say something about the future. Uh, the other thing is that um, if you have calibrated local volatility models before, um, is that they are sort of dynamically inconsistent. So if you um, calibrate um, a local volatility model today with a maturity in say one year, um, you get a certain local volatility function. If you recalibrate your model half a year from now, what you would expect is that you see sort of the second half of your local volatility function, so the bit between year one, time one half and time one. But what you see in practice often looks quite different because I mean, local volatilities often have a pronounced smile at time zero and, um, and then transitioning to skew. So recalibration, typically what you see after half a year is um, that you see again a smile, but that's sort of inconsistent with the surface that you calibrated half a year earlier. So to somehow mimic this, um, what we're doing here is that um, when we generate crisis, say half a year from now, we're using the same leverage function, um, but sort of shifted away by year. So to make the derivative prices sort of look the same. But that of course means that this model here is dynamically inconsistent, but that's of course what you see in real data. So um, the, the, the sort of this um, way of how we simulate our, simulate our prices. So what we do therefore is, um, so we, we simulate the trajectory of our underlying, and then we use um, the Heston SLV model that for each point in time, for the, um, for the underlying and the volatility across a single trajectory, we produce um, a few hundred option prices um, for different strikes and maturities. And that gives us what is our um, synthetic market, um, which, is, which is simulated. And we do that with a lot of time steps. So in this case, um, we had 10,000 time steps um, over, over a year. Um, 
well, that may sound a lot. So you may wonder, do I have as many observations in practice? But um, think about it, this is a year. Um, so I'll say there's 250 trading dates. So that would bring us to something like um, um, 40, 40 prices per day. Um, so that's sort of in the range of um, um, whatever, um, 10 minutes or something. So, so price is observed every 10 minutes, which is not ridiculous. So 10,000 um, time steps sounds, um, sounds a lot, but it's, it's not if you think about it on a, on a daily basis. And um, we're using 46 options here to span this liquid range of, this liquid range of prices. Okay, so um, I'm showing you now a few outputs um, of, this, of this model. So first, um, we are reconstructing um, two factors here. One is um, to minimize um, dynamic arbitrage, and the other is to minimize static arbitrage. So the first one is um, related to um, basically minimize the market price of risk. The second one is a more discrete optimization problem where we, um, where we try to find um, a factor such that um, the violations of static arbitrage um, occur as seldom as possible. So I'm not gonna explain the details, but um, that's a fairly brute force um, um, discrete optimization problem. So, and then, um, so here I'm showing you two things. So on the left is, um, so we're now learning um, the, um, the diffusion process um, for these factors here. And on the left, I'm showing you a scatter plot, which on the horizontal axis has the, 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 the true volatility. So in the SLV model, this would be basically everything that multiplies the Brownian motion. So if you, if you put in the, the simulated trajectory of S into these functions here, um, you get a certain realization of the, of the volatility. So that's my sigma T here in the horizontal axis. And then I'm showing you on the vertical axis, um, what is the actual um, reconstructed volatility that we learned from our factor model? And we see that um, there's a good representation. So, I mean, if, if, the mo if our model was perfect and our learning process is perfect, this would be the straight line y plus x, and we have something that is scattered around it. But um, we've done a reasonable job. And the second plot on the right hand side is, um, it's, uh, I think, an interesting one um, because um, so the first factor here, which comes from um, minimizing static arbitrage, turns out that this is pretty much the volatility factor. So new here is our Heston volatility. So we've completely, we simulated this model and we forgot all about where this model comes from. We're using um, arbitrage considerations to find the best factor representation of the options book. And it turns out that as you see from this plot here, that um, the best factor is pretty much the volatility. So that is quite interesting, I think. Um, Stena, how about um, the, the, the coefficients um, mu and sigma that we learned for the, um, for, for, the, for the first factor? So now knowing that um, the first factor is quite close to the volatility, what you would expect is um, that the coefficients we learned for sigma, sorry, for um, uh, xi1 um, should be an affine function for the drift um, because that's what we have in the CR model and a square root function for the, for the volatility. So, and these are the red lines here. So there's sort of a decreasing uh, affine function that the red line on the left panel, um, which is from the Heston model. And on the right hand side, um, the red line, is, uh, the red curve is sort of the volatility uh, of the volatility. And we see again that um, between the, 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 the true um, functional dependence and the simulated data, of course, there's now a bigger variation um, because we have an inconsistent model. Um, but um, the, the, the general, tendency is, is good. And that's sort of we want, what we want to capture in our forward simulation. So before I end um, and allow some time for questions, um, I'm just gonna show you, I think two more plots, um, two more slides. Um, so the first one is now, um, so this was in sample, how well can we represent the trajectories within the training set? Um, but now we're interested in well, what happens going forward in the future, sort of out of sample. Um, so first we can sort of look at, well, what is the, the, um, the validation loss compared to the training loss? And this is sort of the typical pictures um, from, um, from, from deep learning um, that um, we first have a pretty fast convergence um, in terms of the loss function, which is um, our penalty fun our functional. Um, and then it sort of flattens, flattens off um, after the number of training periods. But maybe sort of financially more interesting is sort of the bottom panels here. So, the first plot is sort of similar to what I already showed you earlier. That is um, first the simulation in the, the blue dots are the, the input data. So that's the simulated um, Heston SLV data, um, which lies sort of within a certain blue band here. 
And then we sort of try to simulate our trained model and we hope that um, we sort of get something that looks qualitatively similar. And we see that, well, first, well, it's the, the orange dots here from the simulation are a bit more dispersed, um, so they have a higher variability. But the good news is that they capture sort of the general behavior of this sort of um, U shape here. And also they always stay within the allowable region. So we want them to be on the right of this, um, of these dashed red lines here, which is um, the allowable region. And um, we achieve that by our, by our construction of the processes. And then sort of on the right of this, I'm showing you now um, again for the, the simulated data and sorry, the, yeah, the learned simulated data and the, the, the sort of the ground truth model, the Hessen SV model, I'm showing you what the tra trajectories look like. So of course, um, these are independent runs um, because my forward simulation is independent from the past. Um, so I don't expect that in a strong sense, these curves look any, any much the same, but sort of qualitatively, um, if you look at the, the underlying and these two factors between the sort of the left three plots and the right three plots, um, they have similar sort of stylized features in terms of periods of volatility, um, spikes, et cetera. So um, qualitatively, it seems like we've simulated something which looks um, realistic. Of course, you could do more um, econometric tests and then, then, then compare the, the quality of these, of these simulations. Um, finally, um, we've also played around with, um, well, what happens now if you had sort of more exotic contracts, um, can we simulate them as well? Um, so what we did is now um, basically construct a, a VIX, a volatility index. Um, now the data we used here is foreign exchange. So it's not the, the CBOE actual VIX. Um, on, on equities, um, but we use the same methodology. So you, you may know that the VIX being a volatility index is constructed from certain um, sort of close to the money options. So the VIX itself is a linear combinations of, um, of options. Um, so you'd expect that because we simulate the options book, um, we can also simulate the VIX. Um, turns out that um, the certain linear combination um, that goes into the VIX, um, um, is, is not particularly friendly to, um, <laughs> to, to our reconstruction, um, but um, what we can still do is um, to do a regression um, on the VIX of our factor. So that's sort of the second line here. So we find the best linear regression fit um, of the VIX within our factors, and then we simulate these. And sort of on the left hand are the colorful contour plot here. That's again a representation between the, the, the true VIX um, within our simulated model and the learned, the learned VIX. And um, it, it seems that um, we're missing a bit of volatility. So especially if you look at the volatility of the volatility index, so that's sort of the bottom blot here is that um, um, our data are slightly less volatile and you also see that in the contour plot. So we hope that one could fix this by including more than two factors. Um, and again, at the bottom, I'm showing you now sort of scenarios that were actually simulated. And um, at least we see that um, if you compare sort of the log returns with the simulated VIX, uh, that the periods of sort of high spikes in the log returns translate to periods of high reconstructed uh, VIX. Okay, that brings me to the end. Um, I'll leave you with just um, congratulating all the Italians on the call for the, for the glorious performance over the last two weeks, um, which gave us a lot of pleasure. And, um, I'll give you the reference um, to the paper that this, um, this talk was, was based on. I look forward if anybody has any comments or questions. Okay, hey, thank you, Christoph. It's time for questions. Uh, are there any questions? Comments? Uh, by chat, maybe? Yes. No. Um, okay, I, I'm going to, to make a very naive question, but uh, if I want to learn about uh, all these topics in order to understand uh, your talk, uh, uh, in this paper you have shown of, uh, in Journal of Computational Finance that, and then about uh, literature that is uh, I will see what are the main papers I have to read to update me. Mm. And uh, what are the, the main papers? Yeah, I, th I think that that's right. Um, so um, you can look at um, the, yeah, the, the recent papers. I mean, in particular, I think a quite influential paper um, is, the, is the first one here. So this is just a 
this table is a, is a very small excerpt of the 150 <laughs> the lines but, um, for this paper by, by Bühler. Um, so th that's inter what's interesting about them is that they address the hedging issue. So they, they try to learn um, optimal hedging strategies in a model-free free way without um, doing the usual feature of learning a model and then constructing a hedge value model, but they're learning the hedging strategy directly from the, from the prices. Um, so that's, I think, um, uh, quite an influential paper. And, um, and then, yeah, so there's the paper by Ruth and Wang. So in addition to the survey paper, they also have a, have a paper where they actually um, propose a, a learning method, um, which is um, it's very um, recent work. And um, yeah, I think the, the work that is the most closely related um, are sort of these, these references here. Um, so if you look at, um, at these papers, because they are also dynamic in the sense that they want to learn um, a dynamic SD model, um, which is consistent with derivative prices, where the others are sort of more, some of them are more traditional machine learning papers and uh, in just learning a sort of static um, relationship between underlying and prices, whereas these are more based on, uh, on SDs and they're also closer to sort of what we're familiar with from a, from a math finance perspective in terms of the, of the modeling. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, more questions? Other questions, other comments? Oral or by chat? Uh, no. Okay, if not, uh, we close here this first session of the workshop. And uh, I stop recording.